first of all, I'd like to say thanks for coming on here. I appreciate it. I know um, you're probably a busy dude, and like this is, uh, I, I appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me and, and tell me about the things you've done and the things you're you're going to do. So uh, thanks. I'm, I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's something that I think listening to all the other podcasts, uh, you know, with, with Brandy, you know, MS, uh, Foster, you know, Laliberte, um, one day, I think all of them, the constant thing was to get you on the mic as well. So I'd love to listen to your story, <laughs> but, uh, yeah. it's, I think this is awesome that, you know, what you're doing. Um, I'll shamelessly say that I went for a 10 mile run a few weeks ago and I listened to a lot of podcast. I think it was Kevin's that I listened to because his was pretty long. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, it's like I usually don't do that, but you know, it was nice to do that. So, oh man, that's that's cool that you're listening. Yeah, yeah. The, these guys, I mean, so far it's been phenomenal. You know, I mean, it, it, like I kind of said in the, in the description, like not a lot of people know who you are or who these other guys are, but they should. I mean, you know, we hear about all these, we hear these other stories from people, and they're kind of in a more i guess a more famous career field but um yeah. you know you guys are like and the guys i talk to are just doing phenomenal things and i think it's important to for people to know that there's other people out there that are doing this kind of stuff especially guys right. like you yeah well you know you do it not for the for the for the glory if you will right for sure. probably along with everyone else that may have done a lot of other things you know you do it because you feel that it needs to be done and there's some selfishness in it as well you know for me anyway um i can't speak for everyone else but i wanted to you know push myself i wanted to get to the hardest level that i could get to within my realm um right. you know and that's what i strive to do um so yeah, it was, it was, it was fun. You, yeah, yeah. Well, I, that's what I say too. I, I, I was like, I, that's the the funnest place I ever worked was at the Seventeenth. I mean, it was just so much fun. And I don't, I don't want people to get the wrong impression that this podcast is only about Seventeenth guys, because like, yep. I have my brother on. He's a helicopter pilot. Or he was an he was an army guy. Um, and but I just want, but that's just kind of like, like I kind of said on my last one. It, this is my sphere of influence, you know. So I'd like to branch out. And I've talked to some other guys that are that they, um weren't necessarily right with us and they're going to come on and I, I, I want to expose the whole community, not just the 17th, but it's just, you know, these guys are easy kills cause they're my buddies, you know, like you guys are, you know, it's just easier to get you guys on at first, but yeah, I'd like to branch out and, and tell everyone's story, you know, every, every tech P or even CCT or whoever wants to come on. I'd love to, you know, it, kind of get those stories out there. So yeah, yeah I absolutely. It, I think it's great. Yeah. 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 So start it off. Tell me a lot of guys have been starting like, what made their decision to even get in the air force in the first place? And then, you know, there's a lot of different stories that, <laughs> that, that yeah. uh, a lot of origin stories. Um, and they kind of go from there. Like we'll talk about what you did before the 17th and then what, what made you, what was the catalyst to get, to get you into the 17th? And then, you know, we'll go from there. So yeah, please yeah. go ahead. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, grew up in Athens, Georgia, uh, from the South. All of my family is still there. Didn't really have a lot of military influence growing up, but it was something that I was always interested in. Um, I remember looking through my granddad's encyclopedias, you know, as a young kid, um, even up through my teens, and just always being connected to the guys that went um, to war. You know, I was like, man, I wish I had been part of the Revolutionary War. I wish I had been part of World War II, you know, type thing. And I was like, I was born in the wrong era, you know. And so as I grew up, um, going through high school, you know, I did a lot of manual labor. My dad, you know, did construction, um, <clears throat> graduated, and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm just going to do construction. So I did that for a year, uh, worked for my dad. That was not fun, uh, being <laughs> the boss's son, because he was a lot harder on me than everyone else, rightfully so, because yeah, he was yeah. like, I'm not playing favorites. Right. Um, and so I uh, ended up going to college the, the next year. Um, so all of my friends were sophomores. So I went to college for a year and then I realized I was like, well, college is definitely not for me because I threw <laughs> myself into the deep end and I was like, I'm going to go be an engineer. And I was already behind. I'd been out of school for a year. So my math had, you know, gone away. Yeah. Um, it was, you know, obviously perishable skills, you know, right, something right. that I learned about later on in life, you know, but, right, uh, right. <laughs> um, yeah, so I finished my first year of college, and I was just like, man, I, I don't even want to go back, you know. So I was just kind of working locally. Uh, my roommate at the time had been in the Navy for four years, and he had gotten out, and we would kind of talked about the military because I was interested, you know, just to hear what he had to say. Um, 
and so I started to kind of gear my mind towards the, joining the military. And this is prior to 9-11. There was no reason to join um, or anything except for, you know, whatever you needed to do. Sure. Uh, school, you know, maybe you needed discipline or whatever the case may be. <laughs> right. um, so I kind of necked it down. I was like, you know, I'm, I'm not going to join the Navy because of what my roommate had said at the time. Uh, <laughs> I was like, I'm not going to join the Army because everyone joins the Army. I, I want right, to be right. different. You know, and so I went and I talked to the Marine recruiters and I talked to the Air Force recruiters. I scored pretty decent on my ASVAB. Um, I was young. I was in shape, but I'm not fresh out of high school. So I have some, quote unquote, real life experience. Not really. Sure. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, so I, I told the Marines, I was like in the Air Force, I was like, recruit me. I was like, you're a recruiter, so recruit me. <laughs> right. And, you know, the Marines were, you know, they did their thing and nothing against the the devil dogs. I've got friends, you know, made friends throughout my military career um, with Marines. <clears throat> but the Air Force, you know, I was interested in getting an education and interested in, in pushing myself. And I remember seeing a poster in the recruiting office of a guy that was walking through a creek with BDUs, you know, camoed up, you know, gun in his hand. And I was like, I want to do that. Yeah. And the recruiter was like, okay. And uh, <laughs> he was like, well, when you get to, when you get to basic training halfway through, they're going to have these different career fields that come through and they're going to give their, their pitch. And they're like, this is, you know, you'll be able to hear more about these guys then. I was like, all right, I'll do that. He was like, so when do you want to go um, to basic training? And I was like, as soon as possible. So this was October of uh, 2000. I was like, as soon as possible. And so I called Did my you mom. have a guaranteed job going in or were you no. just open general? And Yeah, I was, I, uh, that's, I was counting on that midway through basic training with these people coming in. Man, right? I'm glad it yeah. worked out, but that right? could have went a different way. Yeah. <laughs> it definitely could have. Um, so uh, I, uh, I called my mom and I was like, hey, mom, I need my birth certificate. First question she asked, are you joining the military? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm thinking about it. Oh my God. You know, and, and you know, she her being a southern woman and no exposure to the military for her either. Um right, right. you know, she was scared. Uh she's thinking what, the worst, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah, she's a mom. And again, nine eleven had not happened, you know, like probably yeah. some news about Bosnia, stuff like that had been on, but that's all she really knew. Um and so I went off to basic training, went through that, uh met the recruiters halfway through. Signed up, did the pass test, you know, went through the whole, you know, all the TACP training. My first duty station um, was Fort Polk, Louisiana. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. <laughs> I went out there. My orders were to the 548th. And so all the instructors were like, man, you're going to be riding around on a four wheeler, being a fire marker, you know, all, you know, everything. Else. And I'm like, oh, that sounds fun, you know, and yeah. they were an airborne unit. They're like, you're going to get jump school. You'll jump out of planes. I'm like, this is awesome. Right. You know, it's like it's it's in a crappy area of the world, but this is great. And I get to Fort Polk and they're like, you're going to the 21st ASOS. I'm like, OK, so they did some trade because they were like, we don't need people fresh out of tech school coming to the 548th. It doesn't make sure. any sense. We don't really have a training department set up for that. You know, we always have to rely on the 21st anyway. Yeah. Um, so I went to the 21st and got there and Kevin Billman, um, Pat McCrory, uh, who's now passed away and Max Porus, they were the first ones that were there. And okay. Max, I remember going into Max's office because he was an old 175 J. Yeah, yeah, I know. yeah, I know Max. And Max had the wooden scroll with the, the skull and a TACP beret um, on it. And I remember walking into his office and he always had a cigar, you know, hanging outside the, the skull. Yeah. And I was like, man, that's that's so cool. And Max came. He had just gotten to Fort Polk probably uh -huh. a few months before I did. So he still had his, you know, his kind of his Ranger high and tight. Um, I don't think the Rangers had really transitioned to how they are now uh, at the yeah. time. But um, he still had, I mean, he was dead set on that Ranger high and tight. And so I was, everyone was just like, man, Max, Max, like he was with the Rangers. You know, he did this, he did that. And I was like, man, that's, that's awesome. You know, I was like, did yeah. he ever deploy? And they're like, well, no, but, you know, yeah. I'm like, but still, you know, he was there. I'm like, that's pretty cool. <laughs> and um, I kind of just, you know, put my head down and I went through all the first stuff that you had to go through. Um, ended up getting a uh, senior in below the zone somehow, some way. Um, in late 2002, and then in 2003, um, that's when I got married. 
at, at the beginning. And I went on my honeymoon, came back, and the first day that I was in the office, I come back, and they're like, you know, pack all of your stuff. You're deploying in two weeks. I'm like, wait, deploying? Because at the time, everyone was doing Kuwait rotations and stuff like that. Sure, sure. And I was like, wait, deploying? Like, I'm going to Kuwait? They're like, mm-mm. I'm like, okay. Um, they're like, I was like, so how long am I going to be gone? We don't know. Wait, okay. so what time of year was it? It was it was this after September 11th or was it before Yeah, that? so I'll go back. Uh, sorry, I missed, kind of missed that. So September 11th happened. I got to Fort Polk, Fort Polk on August 6th of 2000. Okay. And and we were sitting there. We had just finished doing PT uh, out in the back, and Max came outside. Um, this was probably 7.30, 8.30, yeah, 7.30 in the morning maybe, 8 o'clock in the morning because we were central time. Yeah. And Max, Max came outside, and um, – he was like, hey, guys, you guys need to come in and let's watch the news. They're like a, a plane just hit one of the World Trade Centers. And we were like, oh, you know, like, OK, you know, we go inside and we're like, man, that's a horrible accident. And I right. remember sitting inside the bar. And for those that have been to Fort Polk, that bar is um, I don't know if it's infamous or not, but it's it's pretty cool because it's kind of hidden. But um, I went into the bar and our heritage room. But uh, <laughs> but uh, we we're watching the news. And everyone was just kind of gathered around and they're reporting on it. And then all of a sudden the second plane hit and it, it, the room just went silent and everyone was like, this isn't an accident. Yeah. Like this is not, this is not right. Yeah. You something's know? going on. Like you, yeah. we just, we didn't know quite what was going on, but it was like <clears throat> something is happening. Yeah. And, and I'm still like, I am super green, obviously. I mean, I've been at the place for a month, right. you know? living in the barracks, just trying to figure out like, Hey, I'm now in the military. Like I'm here now. I'm no longer training. Um, and I was like, and then that happened. And I'm like, man, like, does this mean that I'm deploying soon? You know? And yeah, yeah. They're like, they're like, man, like, cause I kept asking my supervisor, uh, who was Kevin Billman, um, all the other guys, you know, we're talking about it, but, um, Max, he left within a week, maybe two weeks. I mean, he was gone, Really? you know? And we're like, Everyone, we're just like, man, what's going on? And then, you know, a few months later, Max comes back and we're like, tell us stories. We want to hear stories, you know? Yeah. And um, that's did he when go I was with the 21st or did he augment somebody no, else? He augmented. He, he, was, he, was with, he was with an ODA team. Um, oh, okay. So, so Max can tell his story, but um, I haven't, I, I did ask, you know, some questions then, but he was, you know, he really didn't talk about it that much. Um, but I know that he was – his ODA team at one point in time was with uh, President Karzai, kind of protecting him okay. uh, as a PSD as, as they went around Af uh, Afghanistan or whatever they did. Um, but I didn't really know all the other stuff that was going on at the time yeah. um, until later. But um, yeah, so I went through – like that was kind of my first like I want to – this is – I want to do that. I didn't just come in to do, I came in because I needed discipline. I needed direction. And I knew that I needed to be within, you know, the military that's going to essentially force me um, to, to pull that out of me uh, right. because, you know, college was, it just didn't work out. You know, I was like, I don't know what I want to do with my life. And so I came in because I was like, well, I'm going to come in for six years. I'll get an education. I'll get a degree. I'll get some discipline and direction. I'll have this six years of my life as I kind of build myself into a man that I want to be. And then I'll get out and I'll go find a really good job and I'll settle somewhere. And then 9-11 happened, yeah. you know, and at the very beginning of my career. And I started seeing people deploy and deploy. And I'm like, God, I am so hungry for this. I want to do this. So that kind of forced me to buckle down, you know, on CDCs, on your initial check ride becoming a JTAC, you know, et cetera. Um, and so fast forward to the beginning of 2003, just got married, um, come back and they're like, you're, you're deploying. So I am, I'm elated. I'm not a JTAC yet, um, okay. but I'm elated. I'm like, heck yes, this is what <laughs> I want. Right. Yeah. And um, I remember getting on, my parents came down, they did this big thing. You know, my mom was, scared and crying and i think she cried before every deployment anyway but you know <laughs> she was scared and crying and she was being a mom my dad was just for sure, hey, for sure. hey you know protect yourself you know watch out for the others you know type thing being he was yeah. being a dad and um 
you know, they sent me off and they, uh, we got on a bus at Fort Polk and we drove to Alexandria airport and we got on a C5 with a bunch of helos on the bottom and some other, uh, vehicles. And we get up top and my parents had actually gotten there before the bus did. And they got a tour of the C5. They were like, our son is, is deploying and he's going to be on this C5. You know, like (laughs) my mom was asking everyone. Right. And jokingly, when I come back, she was like, do you want me to call the president? You know, she, she always did that. She was like, oh, well, I'll, I'll call, you know, Bush, I'll call Obama, you know, and we'll get you off this deployment. And I'm like, mom, that's, that's not how it works, but, um, she was just trying to protect me. So, sure. but, uh, yeah, um, deployed. And I remember touching down in Kuwait and getting off the helo and just feeling the heat at night. You know, I was like, oh man, I was like, I'm here. Like I'm here. This is it. And yeah. Yeah. Little did I know, like, what the rest of my future, the next 20 years was going to be. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, I essentially got assigned to, it was me and three other guys from the 21st that deployed. And then they had a squadron from the 2nd Armored Cavalry, Cavalry Regiment um, at the time. Okay. And <clears throat> we were pulling screening operations for the 82nd and the 101st. So everyone knows the Marines and 3ID kind of did their race from Kuwait all the way up to Baghdad. And then you had these other units who are essentially going through the towns and actually clearing through. And we were just doing screening stuff. Didn't really see anything, you know, didn't see much on the way up there. Um, It, it, you know, at this point in time, it's kind of a blur. I've got pictures somewhere stored away um, from a little uh, throwaway camera that we had back then. But um, I, I got assigned to a Balo. So an A-10 pilot, uh, Captain France was his name. I can't remember his first name, but he was the guy that like I had to basically, he knew nothing about, you know, the ground stuff, you know, except for his Balo training. Right. And um, uh, I was his driver and we basically just, we went all the way up. Uh, We got to Baghdad. We were with the Marines um, up there in Baghdad in Sadr City, um, which I didn't know Sadr City was so bad until I went back the next year. Um, Uh But we were driving around in light skin Humvees, no armor, no nothing, doors off, you know, three vehicles, you know, just patrolling through areas or going to meet someone, um, going over to uh, Saddam Hussein's palace right there in Baghdad. You know, it it was really cool. I was like, man, this is awesome. Like, this is, this is war, you know? And I'm like, right. But I look back on it now and I kind of laugh, you know, I was like, man, you're, you're so green, you know, but yeah. you're proud of yourself and, and there's nothing wrong with that. But there was a lot that I didn't know as well. And, um, well, honestly though, that was kind of a good, um, a lot of guys get thrown into the mix like right away, like, you know, mm-hmm. the, the, the really bad stuff. So that was almost kind of like a nice little precursor to your later on, you know, you kind of got to, you got to ease into it. You didn't really get hit, you know, I guess, um, you didn't get hit that hard. So it was kind of like, uh it didn't leave a bad taste in your mouth or you didn't get any kind of uh, trauma out of it, you know? So it was just more like, uh, yeah, know, preparing I, you for what, what to preparing you for the, what could come later, I guess. Uh, yeah. The, the one thing, um, I mean, I do have a little, a few things that, that happened, like we'd be driving down the road and people would, you know, just shoot at us and whatnot. But I remember one day, um, we were looking for a guy and I can't remember why we were looking for this guy, or what we were doing, but there was a troop and we had driven up, and there was a troop from the squadron that was there and we were just kind of you know doing a security halt basically in the middle of baghdad probably somewhere in Sadr city i don't remember but these three guys um they were on a motorcycle together and they came around in the corner and they just started shooting at us you know nothing like you're three guys on a motorcycle against you know a troop i know um, you're Bad decision. You, know, you don't stand a chance but all i remember is you know they were trying to think about it in my head they were maybe 50 meters away from me and i remember getting down on a knee and coming up and had my aim point and there was an army guy in front of me um that that popped out right when i got down on knee. i was getting ready to pull the trigger too and so i jumped up and i went to the left and i got down back down on a knee and i pulled the trigger and i just started you know shooting some rounds at the guys and you saw them falling off and no one really knew what to do and i remember running up to the first guy and for some reason, I was like, let me check his pulse. But I had gloves on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So this is how green I am. Might be tough. But yeah. I'm like, well, let me check his pulse. Like, I'm just, I don't even know why I'm doing this. I'm just doing it. Right, right. And the, he was still alive. He was breathing, but it was, you know, it was labored. 
And I remember looking at him and I, I kind of looked down as I'm on a knee over him and I looked down on him and he just, his eyes just like went blank and yeah. he just kind of did that last breath of, you know, he let it out. That sticks with me, you know, even to this day, I remember it. Um, I'll bet. And, but that was the first time that I, you know, saw like a dead body in war. Right. Yeah. And so I'll follow this up with a funny story. So we were loading these bodies up onto a, a truck that had come by and they're like, we'll take them. And I remember loading one of the guys up and he was a little heavier set. And so we're trying to, you know, get him into the back and, um, his, his garment had kind of come up <laughs> and I looked down at his underwear and he had a magazine in his underwear, like on the front side. And I was like, Hey, there's a mag right there, you know? And I got made fun of. They're like, dude, why were you looking down there? I'm like, I don't know, man. You know, it's like, <laughs> but we found the magazine, you know? So <laughs> that's, but within, within probably 10, 15 minutes of all of this happening, you know, you go from this memory that you have you know, that doesn't leave your mind, you know, it, it's not like I think about it every day to something funny. You know, I think that's kind of the war in, in a nutshell. Um, Cause you oh, have things sure. that are, you have things that are very serious, but then you can literally joke in the middle of a firefight as well. You know? Right. Um, it's almost so, like another way to kind of cope with everything, the horror yeah. of it. It's like, yeah, that sucked. But also this funny thing happened and it kind of helps you overshadow the, the bad stuff sometimes, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but so the nothing, nothing much, much really happened, you know, for for that. Um, there were some small things that happened when we when we left because the rest of the unit came in. We ended up going back to uh, we flew out of Biop, and I will say this: I I remember walking through Biop, and it was a ghost town. Like walking through that size of an airport, you know, with no one there. Yeah. Papers just sitting around. I mean, it was, it was crazy, you know, yeah, just surreal. to think about it. Yeah. Very surreal. Um, but, uh, we flew out we went to Germany and we get to Germany and, um, we end up having, so the whole unit flew out and goes to Germany. We ended up having, uh, one of our support people tried to smuggle an AK 47 back. Well, we did our customs flying out of biop. We get into Germany and uh, they're like, hey, you have to do customs again here. And so when this is found out by everyone, the support guy went to um, – he went to Max Porus because he was the senior ranking guy. Yeah. And he was like, hey, I've got a confession. So Max did the right thing and went to the commander. And the commander ended up calling the security forces squadron on on uh, base at uh, Ramstein and um, saying, do you guys have an amnesty box? And they said yes. And he said, okay. I have this to turn in. Well, CID, security forces, OSI, all came down to the airfield. They went through all of our stuff. Um, any any uh, war trophies that you that may be considered war trophies, you had your top laid down with a picture. I had an Iraqi like soldier handbook, some berets, mm -hmm. like a little chest rack type thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I was, I was like, man, am I going to get in trouble for this? You know, I didn't know I was supposed to, like, I didn't know I could not, you know, not take this. Right, right. And um, uh, we stayed there for a week. So they put us in a uh, launch stool right outside of Ramstein for a oh week. God. And we we're just like, well, we, you know, I don't know if I'm in trouble, but come to find out I didn't get in trouble. So everything was good. The whole investigation was on the guy that did the, the k47 stuff yeah could and you so leave launch there school or were you guys just like stuck there for a week and they just brought in chow or what we, i mean like no we we could do whatever we wanted oh okay. we stayed in like a hotel type thing I don't, I don't know how to explain it um but it was a really small like mom and pop type hotel sure, sure. um right there in the middle of launch school so we basically went you know we went to k-town um we went all over um Wait. Because some some of the guys that were there had just PCS to Fort Polk from Germany, so they knew. Oh, so they knew the they knew how to. So we just where to go around. and all that. Yeah, yeah, like going to McDonald's <laughs> to get a beer, you know, it was, it was like <laughs> right, okay. Right. But uh, yeah, so we stayed there for a week, but then the 18th ASOC commander had us fly back to Kuwait from there, and so because he wanted to talk to us, 
And so, oh, really? we, yeah, yeah, because he was like, we put this memo out, you know, this and that. And, you know, I guess he just wanted to make his point proven. But, yeah, yeah we we flew back to Kuwait uh, as a whole unit. We we got our we got talked to, um, right. you know, and and then, you know, it, we left. I went back home. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, and then once I got back home, got set, you know, settled back in. Um I had that summer and I basically trained up, uh, for JFCC. So I did, I did airborne school, um, JFCC and then air assault, like that whole summer. That's what, that's basically all I did. Nice. Then I came back and, you know, January of 04 is, is when I got my, uh, JTAC check ride. Did another deployment in 2004 as a JTAC, went back to Iraq. I was back in Baghdad, um, so that was when Ramadi, I believe, was starting to kind of pick up, and a lot mm-hmm. of the counterinsurgency stuff was starting to really pick up at the time. Yeah. Um, so I did that deployment. Nothing really came of that. Uh, we basically set uh, QRF basically the whole time. So didn't really see much. Got to do some AC-130 call for fires um, in Sadr City, um, which was, you know, that was a lot of fun. Um I don't know how much of an impact we made because everything was still kind of like, how long are we going to be here? What's going on? Right. But in the back of my mind, I was like, man, I just want to get to Afghanistan. Like, that's where I want to be, you know? Yeah. And so came back from that and then didn't deploy in 2005 because of there was some PME stuff that I was doing, um, ALS, some other, uh, I think I got promoted, I believe, to staff sergeant. Um, and then in 2006, oh, oh and the, the, that was what it was. The transition for 2005 was second ACR left, and they went up to Lewis and became a striker brigade, and they were standing up fourth brigade, tenth mountain at Fort. Polk. Okay, oh, so that's right. There was yep. a big transition that was happening locally, um, and we didn't really know what what we were doing. We still had some guys that were augmenting ODA teams and and other ASOS as, as needed. Um, and then 2006 comes around, and <clears throat> Uh, a battalion was sent out and we had the manning to basically man that like a ranger battalion. So we had six guys deploy with that one battalion. So all of us were at the company level slash platoon level as needed. And so that was a really good segue for me going into the 17th. Yeah. But that 2006 deployment was, it was six months long and that was when I really got my first tastes of actual firefights yeah and and calling in bombs and and everything else um we we got put in the argandal valley uh which is just to the northeast of kandahar and this was right after uh del toro uh, had his incident uh, Mm -hmm. in december of 05 so we got there in march of 06 and replaced the guys from the 173rd uh at larzab i believe is what it was okay um the name of the fob um but yeah, so you know, went through that deployment. Um, some of the best people that I've met that I'm still friends with, uh, from the the JTAC side of the house, like that group of guys that deployed, I still keep in touch with all of those guys. Um, like as they like, I'm down at at Herbie now. So as yeah. they kind of come through, uh, whether it's just hey, we're coming on vacation or whatever the case may be, TDY, because uh, some of them are still in. The Air Force. Some of them yeah. got out, and they. One of them is an OSI guy now. Um, another guy got out and said, "I'm going to go fly Apaches." And then he got basically he he got put into the Army's fixed wing program. So he's in the guard now that, and he's flying fixed wing, you know, stuff nice. for the Army. Right. Um, yeah. So, but that deployment was was definitely um, a huge taste of what firefights were actually yeah. about. Um, for the most part. Yeah, yeah. And my first, the first time I dropped as a JTAC was from a B-52 and I did four 2000 pound bombs, airburst, staggered in the mountains. Cause I, I couldn't really see them. I knew where they were, but I couldn't see the people. They were 400 sure. meters away and I'm sitting there. And I remember as I'm sitting there in this little rock circle, it was me, the platoon leader. And then um, one of the team leaders was to my left and I'm telling the platoon leader, I'm like, hey, I've got B-52s. They're coming here. They'll be here in you know, 10, 15 minutes or so. I'm going to pass them the nine line as soon as I make radio contact, et cetera. And as we're yeah. talking, you know, you just hear this loud crack and a whir. And I saw the PL kind of jerk uh, to his left. And around basically came and hit the rock 
right on his right arm. It skimmed his right arm, and then the round went in between me and the team leader because we oh heard the, God. the word go, behind, go by us. And you kind of sit there, and you're like, well, that just happened. You yeah. Know? <laughs> and then you just you keep going. And sure, sure. B-52s check on. And I remember I had my 1 to 50 out, and I'm like, okay, I'm here. I look up. There's a saddle right there. I see the saddle on the map. This is where I need to drop the bombs, you know? Sure. And so I'm passing them uh, the nine line. I'm giving them everything. I'm like, hey, I want three 2,000 pound bombs, air burst, staggered 100 meters apart, you know? And uh, the PO looks at me. He's like, hey, are we good here? I'm like, yeah, we should be good. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, if I could think back to my answer, you know, it, I was caught up in I'm getting ready to drop. You know? Yeah, yeah. Like I did some AC-130 stuff, you know, in Iraq, but that's not the same. Yeah, it's yeah. like I'm getting ready to do my job. You know, I've yeah. Think with the gunship, it's kind of like you're in control, but not kind. Of, it's like you're both in control. You know, it's like with, yeah. Whereas fixed wing, they're relying on all the data to come from you, and that yep. you know they're you know where yeah. So and, and it, especially especially at the time with the B-52s, they had no pods or anything at the time. Oh, so they couldn't yeah. see anything. It's just like, you tell us where you want it and we're going to fly, you know, in that direction and drop. All right, and right. so um, I'm just, you know, doing the thing and I'm like, you know, cleared hot, you know, and they're like bombs away 32 seconds. I, I think it was something like that, maybe 34. I don't remember, yeah. but I just remember hearing it and I tell the PL, I'm like, you know, 30 seconds. And he's like, okay. And I'm just like, I mean, the pucker factor for me, you know, because I'm nervous as crap. Yeah. Um, I've got, I did everything from a one to 50, you know, like an eight digit grid, you know, and I'm right. like, <laughs> <laughs> but then they hit. And I just remember, I mean, being 400 meters away from, you know, 6,000 pounds of ordnance airburst, like I didn't realize how much I would feel the effect. Yeah. It's you not know, that far when, when you have that kind of. When you have that kind of ordinance, for sure, yeah. Right, and it's not the yeah. same as you know red leg, you know range when you're out doing training and you're dropping right. a you know two thousand or a five hundred pound bomb that's two kilometers away. Right, you, know, you still feel it, but you don't. It's it's just different. Sure. But I remember all the rest of the platoon as soon as as soon as it it, it detonated, like they stood up and they were like, yeah, you know, they're just <laughs> you know flipping off. You know, they were cussing and everything else, and I'm like, hey, sir, like they should probably. Like, we don't know if these bombs yeah. are effective or not, yeah, you know, exactly. um, thankfully <laughs> they were, <laughs> yeah, thankfully they were. Um, but, uh, there was some other things that happened for that deployment, but you know, nothing, nothing big. I mean, I dropped a few more times, um, had several other firefights, you know, there were some other, uh, small things that happened. Um, you know, like the company commander ordered his sniper to fire over a, uh, uh, a machine gun team that was pulling security during a clearance because mm -hmm. they were, you know, they weren't paying attention. And so he ordered the sniper. He was like, do this, you know, and it's just like at the time, oh, I'm just fired like, over them to get their attention. He fired over He The company commander ordered his sniper to fire over his own guys just to get their attention. Let's just say what that didn't work doing? out. That didn't Sleeping? work out too well for the company. They weren't paying attention basically. They weren't pulling security that they were. The discipline wasn't there. I understood okay. why he ordered that, but it it, it was uh, let's just say that he was relieved, you know. So he got relieved. Maybe not the best new, technique, yeah. Yeah, a new company commander came in. Um, but what was interesting about that deployment is I fast forward, you know, however many years from 2006. What was it? 14, 16 years or so. Um. As I was getting ready to leave, we were setting up uh, – it was a FOB in, in Ghazni, and they were like, we want to establish a FOB here. <clears throat> so they sent a platoon out, and I got uh, attached to that platoon, and you know, we just basically kind of roved the area, you know, looked at the FOB. They were like, oh, hey, you, you're air assault. Like we've got helos coming in. Can you guide them where you want the connexes? I'm like, I'll do the best I can. <laughs> you know, yeah, like I've got a radio, so yeah. I'll just talk to them. You know, it's pretty simple, yeah. but the platoon leader was Captain Silos and Captain Silos was like, hey, man, like you're in the Air Force, right? I'm like, well, yeah, yes, sir. You know, he's like, so what do you know about like combat control and, and stuff like that? And like special tactics officers. And I'm like, I don't really know that much. I was like, I know that. I mean, they basically do JTAC stuff. Um, I was like, they do some assault zone stuff as well. Um, mm -hmm. I was like, but yeah, that's that's, you know, and he was reading a book. 
um, at the time. And I will fast forward, but he eventually became a Stowe. And TJ oh, okay. Gunnell, TJ Gunnell, he he commanded the two six STS when they first stood up, or not first. He wasn't. I don't think he was the first commander, but he when they became uh, as they were standing up, he was one of the commanders of the two six in the early days. Um, and now he works with me in Afsoc headquarters. Oh no, kidding! So, yeah, so he's he's a full bird colonel, and you know he is one of the division chiefs for A three F, or he is the division chief for A three F, and. You know, he walks around and like when he first got there, um, another Stowe was walking him around and showing him like, hey, this is where our ST guys are. And I sit in uh, standards and evaluations in, at headquarters. And so he was like, yep, these are our ST, you know, guys that do standards and evaluations. And I just kind of looked up from my computer and I see him, you know, and he's big smile and I stand up, you know, just a big bro hug. And he's like, uh, yeah, what's up, dude? And I'm like, what's up, sir? You know, how are you? And so it's, it's, it's interesting That's when crazy. you go from, I was his JTAC when he was a platoon leader in the army. Yeah. And then he came back, you know, was able to get released uh, from his branch. And then he came over to the air force and I've kind of followed him throughout his career, but now we're working together, you know, in AFSOC headquarters and we do the command runs, you know, the first Friday of every month, et cetera. Yeah, you yeah. know, so it's pretty awesome, you know, just That's to have, amazing, have him man. That's really cool. Yeah, it is. And he's a great leader as well. But um, but yeah, so I came back from 2006, um, basically walking around the mountains for for six months. Yeah, I essentially became a mountain goat. I lost a crap ton of weight. Um, I was I'm already skinny. I was skinnier then. Um, yeah. And it was just I had this bad taste at, at the at the 21st. Um, there was a bad senior NCO that was just not a good leader. He had been there for a few years at the time. Um, and I just, I was like, I'm, I'm done. Like December, 2006, I'm ETSing and I'm done. Uh, so I came back from that deployment, I think in September of 06. And I was just like, yeah, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, I've got, I've got three deployments. My original plan was to come in for six years. Uh, I'm married. I've got a baby girl that's a year old now. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, it's time for me to move on and, and forget about all of this. And the reason why was because of the bad taste. I didn't I didn't really like um, the deployment wasn't the issue at all. It was more of so of the leadership. Sure. But then Chris Gendron came in, Gunny, as they call him. Yeah. And I know Chris well. And uh, I think Max was still there um, as well. But mm, I can't remember the timeline, so I'm not. He may have retired. I think he had already retired. He may have retired during one of my deployments in either 04 or during that 2006 deployment. But um, but Chris came in, and for those that know Chris, like his personality is is just he's got a lot of energy. Yeah, and it, you know he's awesome. He is awesome um, guy. He came in and completely turned that place around from inside out. He does that, man. With he, within the yeah. yeah. Like he was just like, hey, I've got this. He's like, you guys don't worry about equipment. You tell me what equipment you want. It's my job to go and get it for you. If it's if it's valid and you can validate it for combat, I'll get it for you. Don't worry about that. Like <laughs> we we hadn't gone really on TDYs for training at all. Yeah. You know. And then Chris came in and he was like, what are your issues? We're like, well, we just we always control on red leg. It's like I can literally sit here at my desk and control yeah. on red leg. I I don't. I'm not expanding my JTAC vocabulary. I'm not getting better at my skill set that I need to get right. better at because of this training range that I'm I've controlled at multiple times. And that was the gripe that a lot of people um, had at the time. But he he came in and just revamped everything. And he saw that I was getting ready to get out. And two weeks prior to me ETSing, he like, well, maybe, maybe this is a couple of weeks before that. He comes to me and he's like, Hey, Foles, like I was like, hey, Sergeant. Um, he was like, so you're not going to reenlist? I was like, no, I'm not. He was like, so what's your plan? I'm like, well, I'm probably going to go back home and work for my dad and, you know, I'll figure it out. He was like, that's not a plan. <laughs> he was like, you've, you've got a wife and a, and a little baby girl that you have to take care of. He was like, he was like, I'm not trying to tell you to stay in or anything. He's like, but I've seen how you operate. I've seen how you are. He was like, I've seen your personality. Um, do you know anything about the 17th? Uh, I know that John Welter augmented 3rd Battalion a couple of years ago. Um, that's really all I know. I don't really know much about him. 
he was yeah. like, he was like, let's have a talk. <laughs> and so he basically, he was like, dude, you would be really good with the Rangers. He's like, but you can't, you can't ask specifically. You can ask specifically for that, but you may not get it. Yeah. He's like, that's kind of the gamble that you have to take. I was like, okay. He's like, but I'm telling you, I think that you would fit in really well with them. He's like, you've got a lot more talent and, you know, this war, you know, seems to be going on. Um, essentially he convinced me. So two weeks from me ETSing, I reenlisted. Nice. The commander's support staff did not appreciate that, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I was like, Hey, like I still have two weeks, you know? So, yeah. um, it ain't over till it's over, you know? Yeah. So I reenlisted, uh, G- uh, Gunny gave me all of his package stuff. I submitted my packet, um, in my packet, I specifically said like, Hey, I really want to do this. I want to go to first ranger battalion. However, if you can't put me in there, I'll go wherever you want to go. I just want to be yeah. a part of this mission. That's what that's what I want, um, and so you know, he helped me out with all of that, um, and we did. Uh, so 2007 rolled around, and we did the Dragon Challenge. And what I heard was this is what mattered. But I for some somehow some way I don't know how, but I ended up winning Dragon Challenge as an individual. No clue how that happened because I was like, man, I, like you've got all these other guys, you know, and I had done a dragon challenge before, I think in 2004. Um, and Ed Shulman was there. I remember seeing him there. Um, I will go back to 2004 to one of the first Atlantic strikes. And I think Jimbo was there from the 14th. Yeah. And that's the first time that I saw you. Oh yeah. And, yeah. And you had a beard. I think you had long, long hair. Um, <laughs> and I was just like, like who's who's that? Over there? What's this guy doing? Yeah, yeah. I was like, is, is she? It's a weird is shaving he, waiver. Yeah, I was like, is, is <laughs> does he attack P? Like, what's going on? And they were like, um, they're like, yeah, that's that's JD Welsh. Like, he's with RRD. I'm like, what what is RRD? Yeah, what's that? You know? And they're like, that's the you know regimental reconnaissance detachment. Like, they do reconnaissance stuff. They do a lot of cool stuff. I'm like, really? And that kind of just I just kind of cataloged that in the back of my mind. And then when Chris started talking to me about the 17th, I was like, yeah, I remember you know, seeing JD back in 2004, you know, and he was like, yeah, he was like, you, you know, go cut your teeth at a battalion first, you know, just yeah. don't worry about that. You know, if that's what you <laughs> want, when you get there, then, then tell them that's what you want, you know? Right. Um, and, and, but there's a plan and they'll help you with that plan, but it takes a specific personality, you know, and to, to get to that place. Um, funny story was we had a guy, one of our support guys. Um, so after I, I remember being on a TDY to uh, Utah up at Hill Air Force Base. And that's when the notification came that I got picked up to go to the 17th. Nice. And I was, I was, I was stoked. I was like, <laughs> heck yes. Like things are falling into place. And I think Gunny was like, and you also are going to Savannah, you know? And I'm Perfect. like, really? I was like, I'm getting everything that I've asked for. I'm like, <laughs> the Air Force is like, finally things are falling into place. You know, not oh, right, that right. it hadn't been in place in the past. I was like, but finally I have leadership and leaders that are taking care of me. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so it was just a really good feeling. And uh, um, I remember we had a guy, I'll go back to what I was saying. So we had a guy in our support uh, element and his last name was Benson. And he used to prank call us all the time. Like when we were in our little tack P cage. Right. And so someone answered the phone and they were like, Hey, uh, certain foals, like uh, phones for you. I'm like, who is it? And they're like, it's Benson. And I go over and at the time it was, it was a joke. And I'm like, Hey, uh, yeah, this is, this is certain foals, JTAC airborne, no big deal. You know, <laughs> I'm well, guessing it wasn't that Benson. Yeah. It was I'm Adam Benson. It was a different Benson. <laughs> yeah. It was Adam Benson. And he was, he was like, <laughs> he was like, um okay congratulations you know and you know you know how benson can be you know, oh yeah sarcastic and a little dry at times um not in a bad way um no, no. Just, he's stoic is kind of his personality yeah. but um i was like like i was just I, I turned beet red i was like oh my god i was like what did i do i was like they're you gonna can- blew they're everything gonna, they're gonna cancel my orders you know this is <laughs> this is not good and um <laughs> Because he had, I think he had just became the NCIC out there. Yeah. Um, 
and so uh, worked through through that. Um, ended up PCSing. I remember getting. Um, I remember the first time I met Benson. He was like, "Hey, I'll meet you at the Rio Gate." I was like, "Okay." So he met me at the Rio Gate. Uh, drove us to where the uh, uh, OLA was at the time, mm-hmm. um, above above CIF um, on on Hunter. And you know, I I remember just like I was like, man, I was like, this is this is it. It's like I'm here, you know. <laughs> and I walk into the room, and you've got Benson. There's uh, Woodring, Jeremy Brooks, Bobby Pena, uh, Travis Winslow was the ALO, and then yeah, me. Yeah. And that was that was that was OLA right there. Solid crew. That's a solid and I was crew. like, I was like, okay, you know. And I remember seeing them, and I would tell, I would, we have a text message. Um, group chat that we all talk talk on and in fact i had a phone call with travis winslow uh, about a week ago and we yeah. chatted for about an hour and i hadn't talked to him in years yeah. but um you know i was just like man it's like these these are the guys that do it you know th- this is it but in the back of my head i was like these are the guys that do it <laughs> <laughs> you didn't know what to but, expect yeah. but i learned so much and you know i also learned that uh don't judge a book by its cover ever, sure. you know, yeah. and, and again, I'm still young. I mean, I'm 26 years old or 27. Um, cause I got to, uh, OLA October of 2007. Okay. <clears throat> so I sign in and within a couple of days, he's like, you know, we're doing CIF issue, all of this stuff. Um, I'm going over to meet, uh, so they hadn't stood up Deco. So I was, a, I was with Bobby Pena with Bico. So I'm going over to meet the leadership over there, you know, and it was just surreal for me, you know, walking yeah. through, I'm like, man, I was like, this is it, you know? Um, but then Ben's is like, Hey, we're going to Benning, you know, so we can in process you. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, so I get to Benning and Brandy was the squadron soup at the time. Okay. And. I remember walking in and um, meeting meeting everyone and uh, go into uh, Brandy's office up front. And um, I think in my phone, it's still saved as your number to, to that office when you sat in there. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. But um, um, I walked in and oh, Brandy, you, you know how Brandy is and his yeah. personality. Yeah. And I sit down, you know, staff it's Sergeant intimidating Foles, for sure. so intimidating. I think it's the bald <laughs> head. But um, I sit down, you know, and you've got Master and Brandenburg that, that's there. And Adam sitting next to me. He's like, you know, Brandy's just like, welcome. Don't fuck it up. <laughs> you know, that's pretty much what it, that was my intro. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Roger Sergeant, <laughs> you know, and uh <laughs> We get back. Could you be more specific? Anything at all? Just please. Nope. That's all you got. Nope. I, he was. He was like. I think. I think he added in there. Like you got a good group of guys. He's like. You know. At at OLA, Adam is a phenomenal leader. Listen to him. Follow their instruction. Yeah. And you'll be fine. You know, type thing. But. Yeah. It was very short and sweet and to the point. But he did well, say, no. "Don't fuck it up." And I was like, <laughs> "Okay, I will do my best." You know. Yeah. But the the funny thing was. Uh, I think, I think there was a free fall jump that was going on that day, and Jazz had was TDY there because I remember okay. them walking into the front door, you know, and I'm just like, oh my god, like you know, you just it, it it's the seventeenth. You have yeah, people yeah. that come and go. It's just like this all the time. Yep. So we get back, and um, James McGuffey was the battalion FSNCO for yeah. First Ranger Battalion, <clears throat> and um, you know. Mugs at the time was not Mugs for me. It was Sergeant McGuffey. Sergeant McGuffey you know, right. I hear everyone else calling him Mugs and joking around with him. You know, yeah. and so I I came in on that Monday, went to bidding on Wednesday. That Saturday, we were driving down to Avon Park for a Jaded Thunder, and I'm like, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm getting myself yeah. into How at all. Drinking through a fire hose. <laughs> Very much so. So we get down there. Well, before we leave the battalion, like we're doing, we're literally doing a convoy with the, all the fire support guys from first Ranger battalion and us. And it's like, mm-hmm. here's our vehicles. We're driving down there together. Here's our plan. I mean, it was planned out. I'm like, I've, we're doing an, is this a mission that we're going on? I know, I know. <laughs> you know? Yep. And I remember leaning on the truck, you know, and mugs comes up and he just kind of bumps me off the truck. And he was like, 
it's my truck. You know, I'm like, God damn. I was like, okay. And I expected that, you know, yeah, yeah. not from him, but I expected like, Hey, I know that I'm the new guy. You right, know, right. I had been at Fort Polk long enough for six years and I'd seen new guy after new guy after new guy come in. I was like, but I'd only been the new guy once before, sure. you know, I'd, I'd been there for six years. So I was the, the old guy, you know, sure, I was the, sure. the old head when I left there and then I get thrown into this and I'm like, man, I was like, okay, you're the new guy. Just new guy. Yeah. You're, it's fine. It's no big deal. Like just right. whatever, do push ups. who cares, <laughs> you know? Right. And so, um, we get down to, to Jada Thunder and we get put up in our hotel rooms and I'm like, I, who, who did all of this coordinating stuff? I'm like, I didn't do anything. They're like, don't worry, yeah. it's taken care of. And I'm like, <laughs> ironically enough, I got put up in the nicest room out of everyone. You nice. know, I didn't have to share a room with anyone. I'm like, this, this, this has got to be a joke. Like, <laughs> what's the catch on this? You know? Yeah. yeah. So uh, we get there and I'd been there for a couple of days, seen some guys, you know, control, kind of seen the pace. Um, I think uh, Chief Lindsay had been there. I don't know if he was a chief. He wasn't a chief at the time, but I remember seeing Lindsay there and meeting him, you know, and I'm just like, God, like all these, like, what is going on? Like, this is yeah. awesome. Bunch of heavy hitters. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's just like you said, drinking from a fire hose, but it's my day. I had planned out my mission. I had Harriers, I had a, a, a Cobra team, I had a High Mars. They were actually shooting High Mars, like the little telephone pole stuff. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, this yeah, is this is ridiculous, you know. Yeah. And um, I think we were on, uh, I want to say North Tech, maybe South Tech, I don't remember. But um, we had we were getting ready to leave the base ops building and drive there so we can stage and prep. <sighs> In all of my confusion and excitement and focused on my mission, I somehow locked the keys of the truck inside the truck <laughs> that we were supposed to take. And I'm just like, this is it. I'm getting fired. This, I'm going to get fired. I found that out. And I, I don't remember if it was Jeremy Brooks or Scott Woodring um, because Scott was my uh, supervisor. I don't remember – which one it was, but I had to tell them. And they were like, you need to go talk to Adam. And I'm like, <laughs> and so Adam walks out of the building. He's like, all right, you guys ready? And I go over and I'm like, Sergeant Benson, um, I locked the keys in the truck. <laughs> he was like, are you fucking kidding me? I'm like, I'm, I'm sorry, Sergeant. He was like, he looks at his watch. He's like, we have an hour and a half until they check on. And it's going to take us 30 minutes just to get there. You know? And I'm like, well, in my mind, I'm like, there's still time, you know, yeah. we can do this. <laughs> Thankfully, all of my tack kit stuff was in the back of the truck. You know, I didn't really have much up, up front where the keys were inside the uh -huh. truck. So they came up with a plan, you know, Adam was frustrated with me, you know, sure. in a nice way of putting it. <laughs> we went there. I controlled the best that I could. Um, it was actually pretty decent. I had never controlled a Cobra team. Like we're infilling and we're getting, you know, taking contact from over here. You know, the whole call for fire stuff was, I had been practicing it at Fort Polk before I left, you know, and I'm just like, okay, I, I can do this. I got this, you know, I had my cheat cards, you know, everything else. And I just did the best that I could. Um, yeah. I applied doctrinal, you know, uh, application to it. I, I did common sense stuff. Um, I probably took a little too long on some things. Um, my AAR brief was, was pretty in depth yeah. and I was just like, okay, you know, but just continued. So we got through that week somehow, some way got through that week. Um, the only bad thing was, was locking the keys in the truck. Everything else is pretty decent. I'm like, okay, yeah. thank God. You know, and I'm, <laughs> and I remember talking to Jeremy Brooks. I'm like, had that sound was that okay he's like that sounded good but you know we'll, we'll cover it in the ar like don't worry about it like just focus on doing this and then we can learn later you know right just be safe that's it be safe yeah and i'm like okay and so we leave uh avon park we come back to um to savannah on a saturday i said hello to my wife spent the night with her and then that sunday the battalion had already left and they had gone up to Campbell for a TFT. And so I spend the night Saturday, wake up Sunday, we get back in the vehicles and we start driving up and now we're going to a TFT. Yeah. I remember driving into Campbell 
and <clears throat> getting there it was after dark so um but this is during the winter time um but getting there probably seven o'clock or so maybe um and walking through the jock you know bobby pinion's like hey let's go we gotta we gotta get out here uh i'll introduce you to your platoon they're going on a mission tonight you're going with them i'm like <laughs> okay <laughs> and so um i love it yeah um <laughs> I meet a uh, Sergeant First Class Joiner, who's a platoon sergeant. He's like, hey, what's up, uh, Striker? Are you ready? I'm like, you know, yeah, I I, uh, I guess so. Or when are we leaving? He's like, uh, we load up in an hour and a half. Okay. Um, they had already done the platoon con op brief and everything. Like everything had yeah. been done. You know, Rehearsals and, and everything, I'm sure, everything. have already been done. Yep, yeah. everything. And I cannot remember the FO's name. And so I go to him. I'm like, what, what's like, what assets do we have? Like, what is going on? He's like, this is what we have. We're going to uh, fast rope in um, from 47s. We're going to do an offset infill, you know, to this place, you know, and at the time I'm just like, I, I think I kind of know what all of this stuff is. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, what, what has half of this mean? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> He's like, yep, here's your cough. I'm like, cough. Like, what? I don't, you know, Okay. You know, but I'm looking at it, you know, I'm like, okay, cough, uh, concept of fires. Okay. Got that. Okay. Got I know, I know what these assets are. I get this. Okay. What is this asset? You know, <laughs> and, um, Bobby, Bobby basically just said, here you go. And then he was off to his platoon because he had stuff to do. Yeah. You know? yeah. And he's just like, Bobby, he made sure that I was taken care of by talking to the squad leaders and talking to the RTO and introducing me to the platoon sergeant and everything else. And I'm just like, oh my God, like, I don't like, okay, my only experience, you know, with the battalion so far has been Avon Park. I will have my kit the same way. And I remember uh, when they told me like, hey, you're, you're going to do a fast rope. And I remember going to Bobby. I'm like, Bobby, like I went to aerosol school, but we fast rope from a tower. It's like, I've never fast rope out of an aircraft, especially yeah. at night, full combat equipment. And he was like, dude, it's easy. And he was like, hey, uh, Parsons, one of the squad leaders who eventually was in RRC, um, I think he went there maybe four-ish, three three years later or so. Uh -huh. Right, he, he went there right before I got there. Okay. And uh, Jason Granger was also a squad leader. I don't know if, you've, if you know him or know the name or not, but – I don't know, Gr yeah. Granger, um, he went through RRC, and then there was just some things that happened, but – one of the like he was a he was a ranger squad leader like okay he was born to do that yeah, yeah, yeah. he he went out to uh free fall school to be an instructor out there um oh, he ended cool. up he, he ended up passing away um i think it was 2015 i believe but he he had a incident out there um oh. and so yeah okay. but uh anyway really good dude but uh parsons come up he's like dude it's a 47 you'll be at the front of the aircraft you know um We'll walk when you get to close to the edge of the ramp, just, you know, trace, trace up. There's going to be an arm that goes out. There'll be two fast ropes, grab onto the rope, swing out, put your feet on it, you know, and just hold on. Don't let go. Don't, Don't let like, go. This, <laughs> okay. That sounds, that sounds pretty good. I'm like, so we get on the helos. We're, we're infilling in, um, and we get up there and I remember there was some chatter that was going on on the assault net, which I kind of heard something like, hey, this is the wrong spot. The ropes aren't on the ground yet. You know, I'm like, I don't I, they, they've got it. I'll just trust them. This yeah, is right. what they do. You know, like I've got <laughs> no choice, but I'm going out of the back of this aircraft one way or the other. Oh, yeah. And um, I remember getting to the edge. And I've got my MVGs on, you know, and I'm like, this is high. Like I'm looking <laughs> down, I'm looking down at treetops. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, okay. And I grabbed the rope and I'm just like going down the rope. Like, I'll be honest, I was shaking. I was like, oh my God, like what is going on? And so I'm sliding down the rope and I just keep sliding and keep sliding and keep sliding. Uh -huh. And it ended up being a 90 foot fast rope. I was going to say, it like, like 90. Yeah, because they had the 120 foot uh, ropes out there, and so, uh -huh. um, that was my first, like my first actual fast rope out of an aircraft was a 90 foot fast rope at night into a, a TFT, and I'm like, <laughs> and I hit the ground, and I'm like, 
you know. Whatever. Yeah, right. Nothing yeah. made it. Nothing to it. Yeah, nobody knew. You know, and come to like the big thing is that like cockiness and confidence are two different things. I was sure. not cocky, but I was very confident in my ability. You know, mm-hmm. I was scared. I'll be honest with you. Like everything scared me. I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Right. Um, and just get thrown to it, you know, and then we hit the ground and, you know, they're just like, all right, you know, we're moving. We did the whole TFT thing. I remember the battalion commander yelling at the the PL and I'm like, this is great. You know, this is what, <laughs> this is what should happen. Yeah, yeah. You know, going through the AARs, getting a little sleep, you know, trying to figure things out. Like it was, it was very, um, sometimes frustrating and extremely challenging, obviously at the time, sure. but it was so rewarding. Because yeah. what I learned was like, man, this is a platoon. Like this is a unit. This is a, this is a family right here. And how yeah. they operate, even though they may, you know, uh, throw knives at each other at times, you know, type thing. Okay. They do it behind closed doors, yeah. you know, and it's it's like, man, this is pretty awesome. And so yeah. pretty tight ended, up go- ended up going from Campbell to Knox and then uh, the, the platoon that I was with, 3 Bravo, we went to Bragg. Um, to do some training there with with another unit out there. And like so we wait, went, like in succession, like you went Campbell, yeah. Knox, Campbell, Bragg. Knox, Bragg. So we were gone longer than the whole battalion. Yeah. And went out there, you know, and like I'm walking through their compound, you know, I'm going to their squadron like uh, briefing room, walking yeah. down to like you know where their whole kit cool, and cages it? and stuff. It's amazing. Yeah. I was you, just you like, can't even can't even like describe it you know it's like no it's you can't just the next, next level stuff obviously and, as as it should be you know and, and the coolest part was walking into their bar that they had because we were with a squadron and mm-hmm. walking into their bar and just seeing the pictures and and i mean i was just like whoa yeah you know we don't have and, to get uh, too far into it but yeah it's a it's an amazing place yeah. yeah so we we did that um it was a lot of fun um just doing the the training that we did out there i think we were there for maybe a week but, but, Damn, you know, nice. went out there and did that. I think we did maybe three ish missions with them, came back and essentially you kind of do your refit from all the training and stuff. Cause, and we had a lot of refitting to do, especially me, cause I'm still new, still getting all of my kit, you know, figured out and like all this and stuff. And you just came from Jaded Thunder. So it's not like, it's, you, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and now it's block leave time. Um, so went on block leave, which, uh, was like over Christmas. Um, come back from Christmas and we were set to deploy, I think like 28 December is when the first chalk was, was rolling out. And my grandfather at the time had um, been put in the hospital and he ended up flatlining, but they brought him back. They resuscitated him. Everything was fine with that. But then my uh, wife at the time had a miscarriage. Oh. I didn't know what that meant to a woman um, yeah. until later. <laughs> Yeah. My thinking is like, I've done all of this stuff. I was, I was being a little selfish, you know, to be yeah. honest with you. Um, and I didn't really understand. I probably, I probably didn't give her the attention that she deserved and needed at the time. Um, and, but the good thing is that, uh, Adam noticed everything that was going on with me, even though I didn't see it. And he was like, Hey, I moved you from this chalk to this chalk that's moving later. And I think my chalk left like four days later. So I had an extra okay. four days to kind of, you know, figure things out. Um, but you know, again, I'm not going over with my platoon. Um, so I, I'm going over with new guys and it's that still that frustration of like, let's figure this out. Let's figure this out. And so, uh, remember getting, we were going to Iraq, uh, in Tikrit and remember getting there, figured somehow this is all kind of a blur, but figured out how to get to where I needed to be. Um, Thankfully, Bobby was also there, so linked up with him. He he helped me out tremendously. Uh, we did our first mission, which was a gaff uh, down into um, I can't remember the name of the town now, but uh, it was it was right there, um, maybe a twenty minute drive or so. But went there, and I remember getting out of the vehicle. And the company commander looks at me and he's like, hey, tell the aircraft this, you know, in, in brevity term. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I didn't I didn't say it, but it was in my head. All I did was get on the radio and I said, all stations do this. And I said the brevity yeah. term. Um, 
and then an aircraft came back and he told me some information and I told that information to the company commander and the company <laughs> commander looked at me and was like, thanks. Good job. I'm like, what did I just do? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and we we finished the mission and I come back and the very first thing I do, like Bobby comes up and he's like, dude, how was it? You know, and I'm, he's like, your first mission, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, let's talk. We need to sit yeah. down and chat. I was like, because there's some things that I don't know and I was asked right. to do out there. And so I spent the rest of that deployment um, basically just learning everything that I could, you know, ab ab about this. Yeah. And I was like, that's never happening again. And I went to Bobby and I'm like, you know, what else do I need to know? I, I want you to just go through everything. Like, just talk to me, you know, because Which I just not easy to do because, you know, some of that stuff for like guys like Bobby <laughs> And the other dudes that were there, it's like second nature already. So you, you we forget. Like I had a hard time telling people what, to, how to set them up for success because I, I'd been doing it for so long. I just, I, you know, these little things that I just, it just comes second nature. I forget yeah. to relate that to, to them. So that could have been challenging, I'm sure, to try to tell you everything because, like I said, some of that stuff you just pick up and you just kind of tuck it away and you, you forget that. Oh yeah, he wouldn't have known that anywhere else but here. Like this is a unique situation. Yeah, absolutely. And and yeah. you know. I think a lot of those lessons, it, you can't, you're not going to be given everything on a cue card. Sure. And that's the most important thing that I told guys as I got older, you know, you knew guys coming in that would come and ask me like, Hey, what do I need to know? What do I, need? I'm like, you're not going to give every, you're not going to be given everything on a cue card. You can't make a right. cheat sheet for everything. I was like, sometimes right. you're just going to have to figure it out. Right. Remember, you remember your ROE, remember your law of armed conflict, Remember what, you know, limitations your aircraft have, ordnance has, all of this stuff, the, the, your own limitations. Be cognizant right, of right. that. I was like, because everyone is limited at some point, but also mm -hmm. rely on your strengths as well. Um, but went through that deployment, you know, and there was, uh, you know, we had we had Granger, uh, Pazder, Randy Pazder, um, who became a really good friend of mine. Um, he was the first, he was a squad leader at the time. Um so I did my first mission with 175 with Randy Pazder, and then my last mission with 175 with Randy Pazder as a platoon sergeant. So nice. it was really great just to kind of, you know, come full circle, you know, uh -huh. with my time at the battalion. Um, but we had, you know, we had one mission with the um, the the British SAS, and they came out and they were like, hey, we have a target that's out there, and um, we want to use your strikers to infill, and we want your JTAC your platoon leader and your RTO to be on the ground with us. And then the battalion, the battalion medic also, our surgeon came out, came out with us. Mm -hmm. um, so I was like, okay, you know, um, you guys already have a JTAC. So I'll just, I, I, and I told him, I, I told the JTAC, I was like, you let me know what you need. I'll be on the net monitoring and, and helping you out wherever I can help you out. I thought this was going to be like any of our other missions, you know, yeah. busy, busy, go out there, knock it out, accomplish it, done, come back, high five, AR, you know, that's it. Right, right. It was nothing like any of you know, the other missions. <laughs> I had never seen a call out happen so fast in my life. I mean, it was it was very fast. And then they yeah. were they were in. They ended up having um, some barricaded barricaded uh, shooters as they entered the building and it was a two-story building and one of the guys got shot right above the chest plate so immediately we had a casualty so they pull him out and i remember sitting there at the front gate you know and it was almost like a deets print is how i describe yeah. it but i remember the the troop commander you know just kind of yelling because we're getting ready to cross in front of the front gate because we're going to the striker vehicle to drive 200 meters north with this casualty to their emergency landing site that they had you know identified on a map right and <clears throat> so get up there and um we're sitting there and the troop commander's just like cover and fire you know and then people come around and then we run dash over get in the vehicle you know they load the the casualty up and you know he's right there in front of everyone's face but that's just how it is mm -hmm. get up there um the weather had turned red while we were out there for our primary medevac so we had to rely on the pjs out of Balad to come out so i'm controlling the els site while uh the British JTAC is doing his thing with AC-130. So I've got mm -hmm. just, he's just pounding the building. And the, you know, the uh, the power lines, you know, they're sparking up all over the place. Um, I had the 
the helos on helo common i'm like hey you guys hold off over here you know i think it was a three minute hold hold off mm-hmm. over here there's a break i get on the radio i'm like hey are we good to bring in medevac yes bring in medevac load everyone up and then other casualties just started showing up i think we did four different medevacs that night and i basically just set up there you know and they were just pounding the building with ac-130 all night yeah. long you know and um we were out there you know probably through mid morning the next day they brought in the other, the rest of the platoon was our QRF. So they brought mm-hmm. them in as well, you know, and it was just a very unique experience. Um, yeah, but they, <clears throat> the guy that, you know, got shot above the chest plate, he ended up passing away. Um, and so they sent a Puma up to where we were and flew us down to Baghdad. And we went to his memorial. Um, mm-hmm. so that was, you know, it was pretty cool to be a part of, you know, to kind of see yeah. that. Um, but it was just one of those, again, one of those things where you kind of idolize people like that. These, this mm-hmm. unit, you know, they're world renowned, you know, type thing. And it's just, man, you know, I'm like, man, I've, I haven't been at this unit for a year and I've already experienced all of this stuff, right? you know, within probably six months, you know, yeah. and it, was, it was just pretty, for me in my young mind at the time, I was like, this is, this is pretty awesome. Um, but came back from that and I told you know, before we deployed, I told Woody, um, he sat down, he was like, what do you want to do? You know, wh- what's your, what's your plan? You know, how, what, what schools do you want to go to? What are you interested in? And that's when I told him, I said, I want to go to a flight. That's what I want to do. I said, um, and I think Ranger school had been a requirement or made a requirement at some point. And yeah. I said, I want, and Woody had already been to Ranger school. I said, I want to go to Ranger school and I want to go to a flight. He's like, that, that's what you want to do. He's like, you don't want to go to free fall. You don't want to, you know, go to Pathfinder. You're not asking for any other school. I'm like, yeah. no, because if I get Ranger School and I pass, then hopefully I get asked to come to A flight. And if I get to A flight, I'm going to get free fall and right. I'll get anything else that I want to get. You know, like I, I don't want to just go to a school just to go to a school. You know, it's like, sure. this is, this is my plan. This is how I want to do it. <clears throat> um, so we came back and the the plant that he had talked to Adam, he was like, do one full George cycle. So a deployment, a training cycle, and then another deployment on that next, on that second training cycle, we'll send you mm-hmm. to Ranger School. I said, okay, done. So did that deployment, came back, uh, trained up. I ended up breaking my wrist on block leave when I came back. Um, and so they had the MLAT there at Benning <clears throat> and I had to drive out there and stay in the squadron. I think I slept on the futon. Uh, back in um, Donnie's office, I believe is where it was. Yeah. Um, so I slept on the futon, you know, I'm going down, to, I'm going down to the, to the airfield and uh, meeting up with the guys that are doing the uh, calling the drop and stuff. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, I'm like, yeah, the, here's, here's all the information. I'm trying to do everything through my FSO as well. Uh, so that was, that was unique. Um, <laughs> I'm still supporting BCO but they're standing up Delta company at the same time as well. And they had already slotted me over to push over to Delta company okay. once the, so basically once the MLAT was over, um, so did the MLAT pre-staged had no idea where my staging area was. I'm running around looking for my <laughs> staging area, seeing, you know, all of the, um, the, uh, uh, IR strobes and everything. I'm like, <laughs> why can't I find my freaking place? Like I've got a That's GPS. Right. I, should know where this is ended up finding it you know but um then we did the delta company stuff i'd heard so stan house broke his leg um for for his piece i went out uh to Irwin, and you know and then 175 is next up you know to go do their their uh certex out there their company certex and so we were out there and that was just oh my god doing a doing a certex i don't know how it is you know like in the in the regular army when they're standing up new units but it was brutal. Yeah. I mean, it was brutal going through everything that you can go through, you know, gaffs, uh, halves, your mass cows, your extremely long off. I think our first, they jumped in, but my arm was, uh, my wrist was broken at the time. So I couldn't jump. Mm-hmm. Um, and so me and a few other guys, um, you know, staged and they jumped in, I think it was 18 or 20 kilometer movement through the mountains out there. Yeah. Um, and then we cleared through a village and then the very next day was another movement about the same yeah. length, maybe a little bit shorter, but it was about the same length. 
yeah. it was just like, God. and this is summertime yeah. out in California, you know, so it, it was a challenge, but yeah, it was again, a ball kicker. Yeah. But uh, did the next deployment, uh, went to Afghanistan, the next deployment, and this deployment had the fewest missions. We did 14 missions total. What? Yeah, that was it. We were out at uh, Oregon E, the first okay. half of the deployment, um, and then we went to uh, Salerno after that. Uh -huh. And get, got out there at Oregon E, and brand new platoon sergeant. Um, he was a Granger as well. I mean, this dude is probably 6'3", 6 6'4", 6 bald, just nothing but pure muscle. Probably around yeah. 230, 240. Pure muscle. And extremely intimidating guy. Yeah. Um, loud. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the, the, first, the first mission we did... Um, we went out there and Dan Farida was the platoon leader. Um, great guy. One of the best yeah. leaders I've ever met in my life. Um, really good dude. <clears throat> but we went out there and the first mission we went out on, we're sitting there and I'm, I'm sitting on the rooftop, you know, pulling security, talking to the aircraft, you know, just doing what you do. And I hear over the assault net like, hey, uh, where's the camera to PC cable? And someone's like, oh, I think, you know, 1-1 has it, you know. And one one was like, "Hey, this is one one. I, I don't have the camera to PC cable." You know, and it gets quiet for about five minutes. You know, and then, "Hey, this is one seven. Where's the where's the fucking camera to PC cable on the radio?" Right, right. <laughs> and you know, basically, no one had it at all. But you just I you hear Reuben yell at the top of his lungs in the middle of this village in the middle of Afghanistan. Someone better get me the fucking camera to PC cable before I drop kick someone off the face of this fucking planet. <laughs> just yelling it. And I was just like, oh, God. You know, needless to say, we came back every single day at 1800 was a full layout of all of your sensitive items. And every Friday was a PT test at Organy, e, which that place is a little desolate, you know, especially yeah, yeah, yeah. at that time. But um, yeah, we, we did that deployment. That sounds about right. Yeah. We had um, almost got shot in the foot by the uh, FSO. He missed he missed my foot by about five or six inches, roughly. Oh. Um, were you guys on so the range, he, or what, what was the deal? We were inside of a tent doing uh, transition drills from our rifle to our pistol. Um, so the FBI was basically leading the training, if you will. They were kind uh -huh. of taking us through some pistol classes and stuff like that, so we were doing that. Yeah, yeah. Well, he showed up late that day. We were spending essentially a week if we didn't have missions, just doing the class. Sure. And um, I think it was like maybe two hours long. It, you know what? What else are you going to do? Play Call of Duty, you know, or Halo right, or something right. like that. But um, well keep your tight, you know. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you when you're handling weapons, you you do what you do. You clear it out. Hey, is this clear? Buddy check. Clear. You know, same thing with your rifle, everything. He ended up showing late to the class. Um, I don't think he had a holster. He didn't have a sling. He had some fast tech fastener thing, which I told him. I was like, so I wouldn't use that at all. I was like, just get you yeah. a regular sling to put over you. Um, but he he transitioned and, you know, he, no one buddy checked his stuff. He didn't clear his stuff out. And I guess he still had a round in it from the previous mission because he didn't have a mag in it. Um, and when he, when he dropped his gun down to, uh, pull his pistol up he ended up firing off a shot oh and, my uh, god yeah and i remember standing there you know i'm like like everyone's just like what was that you know because you kind of have that shock at the beginning sure. like for the first couple of seconds you know and i was like i'm not moving you know and <laughs> one of the squad leaders went around and was like basically smelling everyone's gun to figure out who did it oh he didn't you know? fess up no he didn't fess up mm. so they i looked down at my right foot and i saw a hole it was about six inches away from my hill. I'm like, God dang. But it's so weird. You didn't fess up. Like you, you, everyone heard it. Like we know someone shot their their rifle. Well, like, I don't know. Yeah. So uh, this was after one of the bigger missions that we had done yeah. um, where we infilled and <clears throat> we had, it was an offset infill and we just started walking and we, since it, we, I had A-10s, and I also had AC-130, and then I had um, AC-130 as well. And the AC-130s, they were delayed due to um, indirect fire at Bath. And so the company commander was like, hey, I'm good. Like, it's an offset infill. Um, I've already talked to the helos. They're also good. We have fires coverage. We have ISR coverage. I think we had an MQ-9. 
Um, so we're, we're good. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm comfortable with that, you know? Sure. And so we, we begin to infill and maybe two kilometers or so into our infill, like there was, we had to circumvent around the South side of a, a village. And, um, there was a, I heard a shot off to the North of us. And so I get on the net real quick and I'm like, Hey, possible warning shot. Um, and that's all I say. So I have the ISR asset looking at the the target and giving me updates. I've got A10s above us, you know, following us essentially. And um, we're going through this big open field and there was two hilltops to the north of us, about 400 meters, roughly. And all of a sudden, just gunfire. I mean, it was just a rain of bullets, just, you know, RPGs, gunfire. Um, I didn't see it, but... The A-10s and other assets that came on afterwards said that there was also a mortar firing pit at some point, or point mortar firing point, um, and they saw mortar rounds being being launched. And um, but I didn't see any of that. But I remember getting down on a knee and I see this FSO just basically laying on his side in the fetal position. And I'm like, Jesus Christ, you know. But you know, again, we all react differently. I, I don't know what his previous exposure to combat had been. I, I just you know, mine had not been that much, you know, I was still fairly new. I had one deployment under my belt, yeah. um, but I had a, a job to do and I just focused on that, you know, and come to f the, I had to abort the first pass because they came in on the wrong heading and yeah. somehow I noticed which heading they were coming in. Cause I saw the, I, the IR lights from the aircraft and I had them coming in doing strafing runs. So I had to abort them because the tail end of the platoon, which is where I was at, it was me, the company commander, the platoon sergeant, FBI, RTO, FSO, et cetera. Um, we were back there and we were kind of in the frag pattern is what I assessed just, mm -hmm. you know, as quick as I could. Um, yeah. And so I aborted them because I wasn't comfortable, which is a very hard thing to do <laughs> in the middle sure. of a firefight. Yeah. Um, and so he came back around, you know, and started doing his strafing runs and then, uh, you know, we ran over, um, uh, I don't know if you know Jesse Yandel or heard of him. So, Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he was at 175, that. and then he went up to 275 to be a first sergeant. But he had taken some RPG shrapnel, so he was a casualty or an injury at the time. And then we had our dog guy that was also, uh, he had gotten shot, I think, in the clavicle. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we had two injuries that we were trying to figure out. ISR assets, they just, you know, in those situations, you start getting pushed assets. I think I had 10 assets at the end of the night in my stack right. that I'm trying to manage. Um you know, but it was it was just the amount of gunfire that was coming. I was like, this is ridiculous. Like how okay. we only had two is beyond me. I have no idea. But um, we all kind of we all got together. I got yelled at by the platoon sergeant, you know, like whatever. You know, I don't know. We can talk about this later. Yeah. Um, what, what was he yelling at you about? Why didn't the A-10 see them? Oh, I mean, I, I can only give them a sensor tasking. I can't. You know, yeah, you know exactly. That's about, about all I can do. But uh, he yeah, probably felt so, helpless. You know, he, he, these guys are getting shot up, and you know, you're the you're you're his savior at that point, and you're not doing your job. So I could say I'll get a little heated, for yeah. sure. But yeah, uh, and you know, you you kind of move on from that. You know, and right. we did. Oh yeah, it, for sure. It's it's it is what it is at the time. Um, but we ended up uh, carrying Jesse back. Um, Jesse's a big guy. They call him Jesse the Body Yandel for a reason. Um, <laughs> but. But, you know, he's he's a bigger guy, so we, we carried him off. Um, we had to take kind of rotated people carrying him as we went 600 sure. meters, 600 meters back for our exfil. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, the 101st went in the next day because they owned the battle space and they took pictures of what it was. And they ended up getting to a small gunfight as well um, when they went out there. But what the, the full story of that was... Um, there was a, there were security contractors that were hired probably, you know, they were like, Hey, we're Taliban. You, you're going to hire us to guard this road because there was some construction and stuff that was going on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever the story was, but they had a lot of weapons and they had a, a, a trench that was dug up on top of these hilltops as well. So the pictures that were taken, it looked like something from world war one. I. I mean, just bodies. And, you know, and I think it was maybe 40 or so EKIA. So know? did you back up a minute? So you actually, they came in, uh, you had to abort them and then, but did you bring them back in and. Oh, and absolutely. More? Yeah. Okay. I brought him, brought, brought him back in reattack and, and then I readdressed the, the correct attack heading and then they came in strafing runs and then the AC 130 showed up and then it was basically just 
A10s coming in, gun runs, AC-130 just pounding like simultaneously, you know, doing that. So it was, it was pretty, you know, it was pretty cool. Once everything finally came together after the initial, you know, essentially 10 minutes or so um, of the firefight, maybe five minutes, you know, things probably go a little bit faster, but they're slower at the same time. But uh, yeah, once everything kind of came together and I had all the assets and I had all the sensor taskings, you know, spread out and we were looking for exfil spots, you know, et cetera, you know, that's when it was like, you can kind of had a little bit of time to breathe and figure out some things. Things slowed down a little bit more uh, than, than you just exfil. And we went back and, you know, uh, Jesse's fine. The dog guy, Dixon, he's, he's fine. Um, You know, so Jesse, he, I ran into him a few deployments later when I was with RRC uh, up in uh, Mez and he was like, you know, I walked in and just talking to him about what I was doing and trying to explain to him about the mission that we were doing. And he was like, Hey everyone, like this guy saved my life. And I'm like, no, I didn't, <laughs> you know, but he credited me but with you that. you kind of did because it, I mean, who knows how bad that could have been had you not brought, had you not had those assets on station. Yeah. If, I mean, you being the JTAC, you know, it could have been another JTAC, but the, but you, uh, I, you know, don't sell yourself short on that one, man. I mean, if you hadn't, if you hadn't neutralized that threat the way you did, I mean, you guys could have been out there all day and night. I mean, you got, who knows what kind of, they could have got reinforcements and you guys could have taken a lot more casualties, you know, but you yeah, know, you, I just, you having the wherewithal to do that, save those yeah, guys' I, lives. I just kind of look at it as, you know, I was here. I did this. I did my job. I did what I was supposed to do. Um, and and that story is a thousand times resonated within the 17th as well. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's it's not I'm like, it's whatever. You know, I don't want to make myself sound any better than anyone else because you've uh, got the Tommy Cases and the Brandies and the J.D. Welsh's out there, you know, that that have done so much more. But they also you also would have said you know, well, anyone else probably would have done the same thing. It's just right time, right place or time, place, you know, and you just react and, and yeah. do what you have to do. Um, That's what I love about you guys, the humility and just the the humbleness. But um, and it is our job. And that's you did exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Um, but it's I I'd like to highlight it because while it is your job, it's a different job than most jobs out there. You know what I mean? It's like uh, yeah. there are a lot of jobs that have nothing that would never uh, rise to that level of, you know, danger or uh, importance maybe. So, yeah. but yeah, that's a, but I, again, I like the way you, you frame that and, and the way you said that, it, you know, you, got, you went out there, you did your job and, you know, on the difference being uh, when you do your job, you save Rangers lives. So <laughs> that's a good yeah. thing. Yeah. I jokingly tell them, I'm like, I'm not doing it for you, man. Like it's, it's, I'm doing it for me. I want to get back home to my family, you know, <laughs> right. and, and, but that's the banter that you also have, you know, once sure. you get around guys like that, you kind of understand personalities, you know, you can be a little bit more playful. Oh, for sure. Like, you can, you can, you can jokingly be cocky, you know? Sure. Yep. So, but yeah, so, you know, went through that deployment, um, wasn't again, not too much. Um, there was one other time, uh, so after the the old FSO had left, we had a new FSO come in and we were, I think we were out of, yeah, we were out of Salerno at this point in time. Uh, we had transitioned from OE to Salerno. I think the weather drove us that direction because um, we just weren't able to get assets out there. It was the winter time. You know, there's mm-hmm. just a lot of like, what are we doing? We're not really doing much out here. So we, 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 there was one mission that we did and this is probably within first ranger battalion the most unique mission and experience that i had and we did an offset infill i remember the the jock that was uh, c2ing our operation kept trying to pull my assets and look at different things around the target and we only yeah. did i think maybe it was a three or four kilometer offset it wasn't far at all mm-hmm. and the assets thankfully had the wherewithal as we're walking in to say hey like the, the these guys are trying to pull us over here and look at this are you cool with this Negative. I'm not like you're, you're right. on the ground. You're our assets. We're approaching this target. Right. That's it. If, you know, I, I told the company commander, I'm like, if they want their own assets, they can request them and control them. I was like, but once we hit the ground, these are our, my, our assets, you know, like I, and it was like, they're trying to pull them away to uh, support a tick or no, something else. Exactly. It was like, we just want to check this stuff out. So like, yep. But you guys are on the ground vulnerable. So you, uh, you should be the main priority for sure. 
Yeah. yeah. So so we end up we end up getting to the target. Uh, you know, we set an isolation and containment. Um, I'm sitting there with the the company commander um, and his and his CP, and I get a call over the radio, and they're like, "Hey, we just saw eight armed personnel leave this building. I think it was Building 200, um, and they are now heading to the north. And this was maybe 150-ish meters north of our building." Mm-hmm. And so I, I just, I'm like, okay, we've got armed personnel, but they're heading north. They're heading away from us, you know? So it's not, doesn't sound like it's a threat. It doesn't sound like they're maneuvering to, you know, engage us or anything like that. They're sure. walking, you know, with weapons away from us, probably because we're here. Right. And so I tell, I, I told the company commander that I just like, Hey, sir, um, this is what's happening. He was like, okay, let's go. I'm like, <laughs> that's all he said. He jumped up. And he started running north, <laughs> running. And I'm like, well, I, I guess, guess we're I'm gone. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like, this is this is my guy. Um, right. So I get up and I'm like grabbing the RTO and the FSO because the FSO, this was his first mission. This was actually on January 1st of 2009. Oh. This is his very first mission with the battalion. He's a butter bar from the 173rd. Rudy Varner is his name. Amazing guy amazing amazing guy um grab these guys i'm like let's go and so we just start running and i'm like i'm sitting there thinking like what is he doing what is going on yeah <clears throat> and we start running and i hear the first sergeant get on the radio and he's like hey zero, zero one like zero three what are you doing and it was a uh, first sergeant pertuz um it's like what do you what do you like where are you going and he didn't respond the company commander did not respond and i'm just like Zero three, you know, uh, this is I, I want to say one four, one eight. I don't remember. Yeah. It's like, hey, we're we're heading north. We saw, you know, eight arm uh, ISR reported eight arm personnel heading north, and we're heading north. You know, and I've kind of left it like make your own assumptions. Like I yeah. don't know, you know, yeah. you, your guess is as good as mine. But <laughs> you know, this is my CP, so we're running, and yeah. we're running past buildings, and I'm doing the best I can to sit there and try and pull security as we're running through buildings. And sure, I mean, sure. he is he is legitimately running, you know, and um, I get on the I get on the radio and I talk to the FO, and I'm like, hey, like, you know, uh, Delta, like, this is what we're doing. Um, you've got this asset this asset and this asset. So I gave him an ISR asset and a fires asset. And I said, I'm going to take this asset and this asset. So I, I took the AC-130 um, and the U-28. And I was like, so we both have ISR and fires coverage. I said, smart. I was like, I'm, I'm running north. You have this. Let me know if anything, like if you need to engage anything, you know, what it relay through the assets. Like, I don't know how far we're going. I don't know if, you know, we'll be able to talk line of sight on FM or not. Right, right. We're just doing this. And so I told the U-28, I said, hey, we're running north. Put a steady sparkle on these eight packs that are moving to the north. I said, wherever your sparkle is, that's where we're going. And they were just, I was like, I wanted to emphasize that because I'm like, I don't know what else to tell you, you know? Yeah, right, right. And so we're sitting there running and they're reporting like, hey, they just turned into a dry riverbed. You know, they're continuing to head north away from you, away from the main assault element, et cetera. I'm like, okay, well, we're, we're still proceeding north. <laughs> and so we get to this dried, dried riverbed and we, we start going up that and we're going up that and just now it's kind of a light jog. But I still have no communication with with the company commander. He still has not. He's basically leading out this thing. And um, I get a call and they're like, hey, um, the eight packs just stopped and they're static and sitting down under a tree. I'm like, maintain sparkle. And so we get up there and we kind of turn this bend and we're getting closer to the sparkle and the trot slowly becomes a walk, you know, which we we get there and we're now probably maybe 80, 90 ish meters out or so. And now we're walking forward towards them. And, and you could see the the sparkle. I can, mark. I can see them. Like oh, now okay. I can see them on the ground sitting. I okay. can see the tree just lit up by the sparkle and I can see uh-huh. them up under the tree. Okay. And I'm like, okay. Um, the RTO, I don't know where he is. He's behind us somewhere, you know, um, probably not too far. You know, I yeah, assume yeah. he could probably still see us. Um, while we were running up there, like I hear zero three trying to come on the radio, even uh, like again, but now it's broken. You know, I'm like, Jesus, like how far away? This is yeah. this is <laughs> not good. Are... You know, and so 
um, we keep walking forward and I see the company commander put his gun up like this. And I'm like, okay. So I moved off to his left and we're kind of like in this flying V because no one knows what he's doing. So I kind of wanted to keep him off like in my peripheral. Sure. And I see the FSO, you know, uh, intelligently move out to his right, to the company commander's right. And he has his gun up. We're probably within 50 meters of these guys now. And the company commander, like he just starts shooting. I'm like, okay, boom. You know, we're just shooting away at these guys. And it was amazing. The reaction, like ambushing the Taliban that has always ambushed me. Yeah. Like, that was awesome. They get up and they're just like, they don't have time to shoot anything back. Like we're on them. And uh, I see one guy run off to the left, like into some bushes. So I follow him and then he drops. And I, I remember seeing one guy because I think it was – I don't know who it was. It was one of the other two, obviously. But I remember seeing him, and he gets up, and I see his arm go back, and then he gets hit he with rounds. Yeah, and then he kind of just crumbles down to the ground, and a few seconds later, you just detonation. So he had a grenade that he was oh, getting man. ready to throw. You know, and it was just – it was awesome. And then, like, <laughs> ISR is reporting, like, hey, you've got one guy that's moving across the field to the east, and you've got another guy that's definitely injured, and he's moving uh, – I think he was moving to the northwest. Um, and I'm like, okay. I was like, AC-130, you take the guy that's moving to the east. The guy that was moving to the northwest was moving to a, a village. So there was a village mm -hmm. that he was definitely heading toward. So I was like, U-28, you follow him because I'm not going to be able to shoot in a village. Right. But the guy that was moving to the east, it was basically open ground with, with the exception of, like, one building. So I yeah, told yeah. the AC-130, I was like, you know, when he gets 200 meters away from us, clear to engage, 40 mic mic. Um, that was a mistake on my part. I said, because I told him, I said, let me know when you initiate engagement um, and let me know when rounds complete. Um, they ended up wasting 60% of their 40 millimeter ammo because they didn't were not able to tweak. Um, and I ended oh. up calling, like... As we get to the bodies, like I'm focused on this because this is my, my my near threat. I don't know if these sure. guys are dead or not dead or they're in a ditch that I can't see them. What's going on? So yeah. we clear through the bodies. You know, um, things are fine. <laughs> As we're clearing through the FSO behind us, he starts popping off rounds, and he didn't give us any warning. So that was a little, you know, kind of show, you know, jerked us a little bit. You know, because we're like, oh god, did we miss something? But what we get through. At? a dead body he's he was oh. like i saw him move okay oh. well okay. whatever all right but yeah um so ace 130 i hear them you know they they call over there like hey engaging you know i'm like roger you know so they do their thing i'm telling the uh company commander like hey this is what's going on this guy that went to the village here's where he's at they're you know they're following him he's like okay that's where we're heading next probably five minutes later maybe less than that the first sergeant finally shows up and he looks at the company. He's like, "What the fuck were you doing?" You know. And he was like, "I didn't have time. I just reacted." <laughs> As you sit back and think about it, we had a perfect L-shaped ambush because we yeah. kind of went around, and the first sergeant went straight up. And if we had coordinated it, you know, it could have been a little bit better, but it ended up being fine. Um, but the ace one thirty neutralized that guy, and the guy that went off to the village, he he was very badly injured. I think years later, I heard maybe it was the next year or two i heard that um he ended up becoming like a leader in that area oh really he was he was kind of um he got shot in the head oh uh, so he was he was a little slow yeah <laughs> but uh so or maybe grazed in the head but yeah yeah um yeah it was that was just one of the most unique things that i did with with 175 yeah and it was just a reactive thing that he decided to do it was like okay we're doing this you know nice so but yeah that was that was a lot of fun Oh, <laughs> needless <laughs> to say. But yeah, so I came back from that deployment. Um, I got back two days before my son uh, was to be born, saw my son born. Um, I actually came back a little early, earlier than my platoon. My platoon came back the day that my son was born, you know, so I, I was thankful for that, you know, barely got there. Um, but thank God got there. Yeah. Um, and then I had a slot for Ranger School or to go to the 75th Free Ranger. Um I think I went there about a month later or so nice. uh, after I got back and, you know, went through, went through ranger school. Um, I want to say that Adam told me like, Hey man, like if you get recycled during any phase, we're going to have to pull you from ranger school because we really? don't have the man, we don't have the manning to support the next deployment. Yeah. yeah. Was, you know, but that was That's a huge motivation, mo <laughs> huge motivating factor for me um, <laughs> to go through 
you know, go through that, you know, go through the 75th pre ranger course where they basically made me the first sergeant the entire time, um, which was, it was fun, you know, but it yeah, was yeah. just like, man, I got to wrangle up all these guys. Um, but you were at, at that time, you were probably maybe not in regiment, but you were probably one of the more experienced guys just overall, because you'd been in a lot longer than probably a lot of those young guys. Yeah. So that's, oh, yeah. That's, that's, yeah. I mean, you're going through a pre-ranger. I mean, you know, the, the ranger standard, you know, for the guys that are going through. So I'm the old guy. This is 2000. Yeah. This is 2009. I'm getting ready to turn 29. I'm 28 going through ranger school. And these guys are 20, 21, maybe 22. Right, right. You know, so like I'm the old guy. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> it's like, that's just more, you know, motivation for me to beat you in every physical event. Oh, yeah, you know, for sure. You know, as much as I can. Because, um, they, you know, there's some studs out there. But uh, Oh, yeah. You know, I thankfully I was able to go straight through Ranger School, um, finish that. Um, Colonel Kaidel, you know, they were like, you know, you get through Ranger School, like we want to bring you over to A Flight. I think uh, I want to say that Kevin or maybe Matty Green had already talked to me um, at some point um, prior to that. I'm not 100% sure, uh, but I remember someone saying something to me or having a conversation with me about it. <clears throat> and, um, so I was like, okay, you know, this is, this is awesome. Like things are falling in place. Like I had yeah, a plan yeah. and the plan is being executed. Um, so came back from ranger school. Uh, I had about a month, maybe a little bit more until the next deployment had to do my whole JTAC, uh, check ride evaluation. Um, and then I did another deployment, uh, with Delta company, uh, one Delta back to, to crit where I started, uh, with first ranger battalion. So did that 2009, um, Nothing really came from that deployment at all. Uh, it was pretty standard deployment from what I remember. It was just nice to, you know, kind of have graduated, you know, and, and now I'm stepping in, you know, and I'm like uh, part of the family, if you will. But sure. um, that's how I felt, you know. Mm -hmm. the, the Army guys, you know, most of them, they were like um, – why did you go? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like you don't have to, do you? You know, I'm like, well, I know some is... can't understand. Yeah. It's like, yeah. yeah. I was yeah. like, well, this is, this is what I want to do, you know? So in order to do that, I have to do this. Um, yeah. There, there was one, there was one mission that deployment that uh, we infilled and offset infill pretty standard. Um, we we're going after an old Iraqi Lieutenant Colonel and um, set in isolation and containment. Um, actually containment was setting in and the colonel came out the back somehow i don't know how we got compromised but he came out the back and um he just fired you know some ak rounds down that alleyway and it ended up hitting the uh the lead guy in the leg and so he goes down and um his team leader pulls him over behind a chicken coop that's up, butted up against a wall the colonel's son gets on one the cupola on the top of the roof and he mm -hmm. has a pkm and the platoon sergeant and the medic, they run around from um, uh, some, from the white side and um, they get they get back there. The rest of the, the uh, containment, they had jumped over the wall. And so now you've got the team leader, the guy that's injured, the medic and the platoon sergeant that are basically behind this this chicken coop up against this wall. So four grown men that are trying to do stuff in a very small confined space while getting right. shot at. Huh. <clears throat> and so the medic is working on, on the injury and the team leader and the platoon sergeant are firing back. The most unique thing happened that I, it's just, it's bizarre how this happened, but one of the rounds from the PKM came and nicked the corner or the side of the NVGs of the platoon sergeant hit the corner of his eye pro went inside of his helmet through his peltors and then wrapped around his helmet and fell out the back. Oh my God. The team leader around came again, nicked his NVGs the same side on the right side and then went into the side of his helmet. Like, you know, that's maybe half an inch, a quarter of an inch thick or so hit the side yeah. of his helmet and kind of busted out the ear part of his helmet. I, I I'm like, Holy crap. Wow. How lucky are those guys? <laughs> yeah. And so I mean, this platoon sergeant geez. was the same one that, that yelled prior uh -huh. um, on, on his in Afghanistan. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> like he did not want to exfil, but he was clearly dazed. Yeah. Like clearly dazed. But uh, I ended up 
I didn't even I, I was somehow I'd, I don't remember how, but somehow I'd gotten separated from the platoon leader and I was with the squad off on the side because um, I was getting ready to shoot a hellfire at the house. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, you know, I basically just launched medevac on my own and I put them in a three minute hold and I had the ISR assets looking for uh, a place to, to the eat, to do the, the medevac. And then I, you know, ended up linking back up with the uh, company commander, or not the company commander, but the platoon leader. And I said, Hey, this is what's going on. He was like, all right, cool. You know, thank you. Um, yeah. I said, you let me know when one seven is ready to move and I'll have the, you know, they'll, we'll coordinate all of this together. Yeah, yeah. Unless he wants to jump on the Hilo Common and do this himself, you know. Right, right. Um, but I didn't know that one seven was basically out of the fight <laughs> at this time. <laughs> like he was just he was completely out. And but yeah. he refused he refused to exfil, you know, but uh, the stubbornness of, of Rangers sometimes. Yeah, standard. That's um, yep. yeah. but uh yeah, he came back and um the guy that got shot in the leg, unfortunately, he ended up uh losing i think it was from below the knee down um so he oh, lost really? that uh, mcphee was his name but um yeah we came back and the team leader was just he was a little kind of deer in the headlights because of what happened um naturally and then yeah. um the platoon sergeant like he just looked like he got the crap beat out of him i mean just black like just bruised all over oh you know? my god i bet um but it was just bizarre and i think that 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 moment right there is what changed his perspective yeah you know which i think it would do that to a lot of us um, yeah but in the oh, same yeah. night and then when we when we came back we were looking at mcphee's kit mcphee had a round that went into the side of his plate on his back so he he almost got shot basically in, in, you know in the side you know it's just one of those nights were you guys weren't like, side plates at all or just was it just front and back i think I think we were wearing side plates at that time. I can't remember, yeah. but, but, um, this Still was well, like, man, this crazy. was like up here uh, around his lats where the, the, round oh, yeah. so, so if it, mattered. if it had gone in, it would, you know, it would have been very close to the heart. Yeah. Um, but like that night was a literal night of not inches, like centimeters, <laughs> right. you know, from, from things going extremely bad, you know? Yeah. And I was just like, God, like how did we got out of that with, you know, it's very unfortunate for McPhee what happened to him, but sure. we got out of that, you know, from a holistic picture with just that one. Oh, it could have been so injury. much worse. Yeah. You know, not to so minimize what happened to him, but, you know, this yeah. is crazy, you know. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, went through that. So, yeah, I went through that deployment. And then 2010, um, I ended up augmenting uh, team. Is it team one? Yeah, team one, I believe. It was with the. Uh, Matty Green, because he he was getting ready to PCS down to down to Herbie to the 720th. Okay. So um, I went out to uh, J Bad, um, did a few missions out there uh, in J Bad, and then um, basically got sent over to Kabul after that, and and did that whole thing. Um, they were standing up the program that we were doing in Afghanistan that RC mm -hmm. was doing then. So you know I was there with uh, uh, Dylan Foreman. Um, Edwards, uh, Andy Lyons, um, yep, yep. you know, uh, CJ Womet, uh, a mm -hmm. lot of those guys. So cool. that was, um, that was interesting. You know, it's just yeah. like, cool. Like, this is what I want to do. So I'm going to get a taste it, it was like, it. But it's like another shift from, you know, you were the 21st, you, you got the hang of that. You got the first bat and you're like, uh, this is completely different fire hose. Then you're, yeah. then you, at the end of your first bat time, you're like, oh, I've got it. You know, you're, you're honed. And then you get to recce and it's just like a, probably another another shift of things you have to have to learn you know it was it was very interesting because you know it was it was new i mean i right. think the program got stood up in 09 and it you know was you know going through its its growing phases of everything the training and, and whatnot i think the company was probably going through a shift as well of like well how do we you know just trying to find some traction in it of like what does our training cycle look like so we can accomplish this mission what do we need to focus on we're doing this stuff now um but it was you know it was unique um yeah there was just dylan is a you know he has a very inner this is not a negative thing he just has a interesting personality sure. you know um and so it was just very unique stepping into that uh, i remember flying into kabul at, at uh, h kaya and I've got a, you know, a local Nokia cell phone and I'm like, 
trying to talk to Maddie and I'm like, Hey, I'm getting ready to leave, you know, J bad. Are you guys going to come? Cause they have to drive there to pick me up. Mm. Yeah, and they're yeah. like, you know, it was just, it, the communication was, was a little hard. Um, yeah. <laughs> but I, I get to H Kaya and I'm the only pack getting off and I've got all of my stuff, you know, my, my big D bag, my kit, yeah. you know, my, my tough box that I'm rolling across, you know, everything right. else, you know, and, obviously it's kind of NATO centric there. Yeah. Um, so I just walk in, you know, and I'm just like standing there in the, in the, like the PAX terminal, you know, if you will, I'm like, I guess I just wait. So I took my stuff outside and I sat there and waited. Um, I think I waited for about an hour yeah, yeah. before they showed up. That's not you know. too bad. I thought it was going to be a lot worse no, than that. It an felt was like not a bad wait. It, it felt a lot longer than that because I'm uh, like, I can imagine. Did, yeah. Did he, did he get my message? How, how <laughs> do I contact? Yeah. Where do I go on this base if, you know, nighttime rolls around right. and, you know, like what's going on? Like, what do I do with my kid? I've got my gun. I've got all this stuff. Yeah. But finally they pulled up, you know, in, in the Hilux trucks and, you know, they're like, hey, you know, I don't even think Maddie came. Maybe he did. I don't remember. But I remember, you know, the first guy I saw and like, are, are, are these the guys or are they not the guys? <laughs> You know, yeah. and then I think it was Andy Lyons that came up, you know, just kind of a bright personality, um, uh -huh. you know, and, and he's like, hey, are, are you Justin? I'm like, uh, yep, I am. He's like, oh, what's up? You know, I'm, I'm Andy. You, you need help getting stuff in the truck? I'm like, that'd be great, man. He's like, yeah, I hope you haven't been waiting long. You know, we got caught up doing this. And I'm like, it's, it's good. It's good. You guys are here now. Yeah, you're fine. here. It's all good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So I went out there and uh, Danny Jimenez was out there. So it was it was Team One. And, um, and I remember this specifically because, uh, I'm supporting them, which is a different battalion, but I deployed in support of first ranger battalion mm -hmm. and my grandfather was not doing good at all. Yeah. And so he was basically going to die. Like he, he was, uh, he already had hospice at the, at, uh, at, at his house. Um, I remember getting on, uh, the sat phone that Danny gave me. He was like, Hey man, you want to call your granddad? I was like, yeah. I remember getting on the sat phone and standing out there in the middle of, of, uh, I guess Scorpion is what it is. But at the time it was just a bunch of tents, you know, not yeah. much. And, um, I remember standing on, uh, like this, this mound of dirt cause they were doing construction on, on some stuff and just talking to my granddad and telling him goodbye. And like my granddad was a father figure to me, you know, mm -hmm. and it, you know, it was just, it was very emotional at the time. I'll bet. And I was just like, you know, I came back inside. Danny had seen that I had been upset, you know, and I was like, hey, thanks, man. You know, I appreciate it. And I just kind of walked out quietly and I was like, I just need to go some, spend some time alone. And I had asked if I could go back home. And but the, the command sergeant major uh, for the task force at the time, who was also the first ranger battalion command sergeant major, he he was very strict. He was like grandfather's not immediate family yeah. and i'm like man like if you only knew <laughs> you know, know? and yeah. and what he, what he was going to bat for me i think benson had already i think he had pcs'd already i think he did that early 2010 to go to benning um so what he was the ncoic um he was he was going to bat for me he was trying really hard you know and um danny came up to me and he was like hey man do you want to go home and I was like, it's fine. I've already said my goodbyes. He was like, yeah. and, and Danny told me, he was like, I've been in your shoes. I've been there. You will regret this if you don't go home. He's like, go home. He's like, my chain of command, the people, the you're supporting my team and what we're doing. My chain of command has no issues with you going home. And I'm like, he's like, does your immediate chain of command have any issues with you going home? I'm like, no. I was like, they, they don't. They want me to go home, but, you know this this person is set in his in his rule in his rules right and he was like go home so i went home and me maddie and uh edwards we all came back on the same flight and uh i got there three days before my granddad passed away it was the oh good it was the most amazing thing you know good deal yeah it was awesome and i came you know i was there for two weeks came back um and then I met Andy up in Condus, and then we just we did the mission stuff up there. Um, and that's where I, you know, I I put all of this other stuff because I got closure, so that was great um, yeah. for me. 
Um, you can like focus up, on the mission now. You, you know, you're yeah. not, it's not just hanging over your head like, yeah. man, I wish I would have said something. I wish I would have said something to him or said a certain thing. Yeah. Yeah. So now you can, that, yeah. That was one of the things. Like when it comes to leadership, I learned so much from that. You know, and um, For sure. There was a. Uh, yeah, uh, there's another story about this um, that comes the, the next year, but um, yeah, it was it was great. But but getting back to the mission set, like I was only out of the fight for two weeks. That was it. Just two weeks. Yeah. You know, and it wasn't really. And that's the point. We were I mean, fighting. They, they, these guys, they get this tunnel vision on the rules and it's like, look, I'm not going to be going for the deployment. I'm going to be going for like a week or two max, you know, yep. so just, you know, it's not a big deal. Yeah. They, right. But sometimes they, in their defense, somebody gets wind that you went and then now everybody wants to go, you know, it's, it can steam, it can snowball in a hurry, but it, it can still it's, but. I think yeah. that was all, all this seems legitimate to me. It seems like the right thing for everyone for yeah. you to go back and 100%. Have that closure. Yeah. And, and I came back with, with that closure. And like you said, being able to just focus on the mission now, you know, sure. um, and it, you know, if you look at the other side of it, not being able to go back and all of a sudden this animosity builds up, you know, which turns into anger, which turns into hate, which turns into oh, yeah. now you can't focus on the mission. You know, right. type. Thing. I mean, you can because we're professionals, yep. but you still have this thing built up, you know, inside sure. of you. So, yeah. but yeah, came back, went up to Condu's and um, me, it was me and Andy that were up there. And it was just, that was when things started to get a lot more interesting. So we, we were doing our thing, but there wasn't much to do. It was just a maintaining type thing, you know, um, like, hey, you know, you guys go and do do your stuff and just, you know, check in with us type thing. Um, and we want to make sure that you're you're good to go, you know, so settling in, if you will, when it came to the the program that we were operating with. Mm -hmm. When it where Andy and I, you know, we didn't really do that much, you know, reporting wise. Um, it was just a maintenance thing. So we were like, man, we're we're getting bored. You know, <laughs> so we went over to um there was a human team that was there. And we were like, do you guys need help with anything? And they were like, we could use some drivers. And Andy was like, me and Justin will will do it. Yeah. And I'm like, Andy, I haven't I haven't really been to any driving schools, you know, like nothing <laughs> like this. And he was like, Don't worry about it, it's fine. <laughs> I'm like, okay. You know, it's right. like you're you're just driving. And we went to go uh basically do a meet. And and I it's me and two other guys in the vehicle and we're just driving into town, you know. We pick up this guy and we drive back and you know and I'm just like this is this is nuts, you know. It's just yeah. us and I'm not used to that, you know. Yeah. Coming from a platoon, I was like I'm not used to this um, for sure. And I didn't realize how dangerous it actually was until you know probably two or three years later. Um, well, I was going to ask you, did you guys did you have any assets on station or was it just you and Andy and that's it? You know, that's it. No, yep. no kidding. Wow. Going out. So it was basically me and, and a DIA guy. Yeah. So, um, you know, it was just. Because like, usually in, in that, in that kind of situation, they ask for guys like us because we can bring all those assets to the fight. You know, they don't get, usually get a whole lot of stuff, but yeah, that's, that's some hairy. Shit. It would just, I mean, <laughs> just I mean, I'm going out with. <laughs> I made sure to go out with the stuff that I needed in case something happened. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, it wasn't like, oh, I'll just bring my, you know, 148 or my 152, you know, and right, call right. it a, call it a day. You know, like we're good. Yeah, yeah. It's like, no, I'm gonna bring something a little bit more, and I made sure everything was good. You know, like th I didn't know what I didn't know at the time. Sure. Um, but yeah, we did that a few times. Um, you know, learned a lot about that side of the house, which was very yeah. interesting. Um. Andy went out on some missions uh, uh, while he was there. Um, the, the regimental, it, there was a platoon from the regiment that was there. Actually, my old platoon was there. Um, and so I, I went, uh, uh, Ruben was there and he was chill. As, as soon as I saw him, I, he was like, hey, what's up, Justin? I'm like, <laughs> You've no. never called me Justin, you yeah. know. <laughs> but uh, it was just, you know, it was interesting, you know. And and I yeah. went to the the JTACs that were there, and I'm like, hey, if you guys like, one of them I obviously knew that was from the regiment, and then the the other guy, um, you know, he's from Bragg. So you know, talk to them. Like, if you guys need anything ever, let me know. I've got kit. I've got all of this stuff. Um, if you want me to go out or do anything, I can go out and do that with you, as long as it doesn't, you know, affect anything that I'm doing up here. It's not a big sure. deal, you know. So. Nice. But yeah, things worked out. Came back from that deployment and um, 
had orders to PCS. And I'm like, I'm going to Benning. And then, you know, some things happened uh, administratively and they needed me to deploy again in 2011. So I deployed again in 2011, uh, went down to a supported SECO um, in Bastion and Mark Foster was in Kabul. <laughs> And I'm, I'm like, man, I've got orders. I've already, I pushed my orders to the right six months, um, you know, which you do what you have to do. I didn't like mm -hmm. it, but it is what it is. Um, and so I uh, deployed and sitting there talking and trying to figure out like, hey, maybe I can go back home like mid rotator, you know, like halfway through the deployment, you know, and, and go ahead and start, you know, my, my future with, with binning and PCS and do that, that whole thing. <clears throat> and, um, uh, I talked to Mark Foster and Mark was like, dude, I'm not doing anything up here. It's like, I can come and replace you down there. He's like, I haven't been with a platoon in a long time. And I'm like, okay. So we started that conversation. Um, and everything got blessed off. Everything was good. I'm like, this is awesome. So Mark came and replaced me at Bastion. Him and I went out on a, I think two or three missions. Um, and that, so it was interesting because, you know, Mark, the mentor became the mentee, you know, at the time yeah, uh, yeah. because Mark hadn't ran with a platoon in a long time. So I'm sure. trying to update him like, hey, here's some comp here's some platoon SOPs. I haven't worked with this platoon, but it's pretty standard across 175. You right. know, here's here's all of this stuff. Um, I had already, you know, thankfully I had been a good JTAC um, and the platoon was like, yeah, we'll take fulls. Not a big deal at all. You know, he, he didn't yeah, yeah. do any any training with us the entire training cycle, but we'll take him. Yeah. Because uh, I didn't know that I was going on this deployment until a month out from the deployment. Like my yeah. house was basically boxed up and packed up and everything else, and then I had to re kind of kind of reshift a little bit and yeah, um, yeah. you know talk to my family and uh, but uh you know so said bye to Mark. I was like, man, you guys are in good hands. Mark is you know old school JTAC. Like he's got you. I've spun him up on everything. Um, Adam had come out right before that to do like a battlefield circulation tour along with Colonel Kaidel. Uh, so <clears throat> we, uh, I went back to, uh, Kandahar where Randy Pazza was the platoon sergeant. Rudy Varner was out there as the FSO. Um, I think, uh, Donaldson was out there who okay. became the regimental sergeant major. Yep. Um, so he was a first sergeant at the time in uh, Delta, Com he was a Delta company first sergeant. Okay. Um, Said goodbye to all those dudes, uh, re-enlisted um, out there, you know, with the 160th. It was awesome, you know. <laughs> um, I was like, man, this is this is this is the way to go, you know. Right. I was like, this is this is great. I'm re-enlisting downrange. I'm able to do this with the guys that I've been with for years, you know, seeing combat, doing all this stuff. Um, this is awesome, you know. Yeah. And then I get to Bath, and the guy from the previous deployment pops up again, and um, he basically shuts it down. What? Yeah. And so the, the, the big kicker was this deployment, my other grandfather had passed away and then my biological father had passed away within two weeks of each other. Oh my gosh. And I wasn't close to my biological father, but there was a red cross message out there because that was immediate family. Yeah. And, um, I was just like, man, you like, and he wouldn't have it a funeral. It was going to be a, a memorial type thing, but the whole point was I wasn't supposed to go on this deployment in the first place. I've worked through everything. I've got a replacement. Everyone is covered. There's no yeah. issues with anything. You know, I've already gotten to Bath after I reenlisted, you know, and I've already got a flight home. It's leaving in three days. Yeah. And it basically just got shut down. So I got sick. You think you remembered your name from before and he was like, oh, not this time. Or was it was a grudge, you think, or just. I, I, being the same guy, the professional side of me wants to say it wasn't a, a grudge because I don't think you should have a grudge at that level, um, over those types yeah, of things, surprised though. <laughs> but <laughs> yep. Surprised. Yep. Um, I don't know if it was a grudge or not, to be honest with you. I just okay. kind of, you know, you roll with the punches. I was mm -hmm. like, okay, I was pissed. I was angry. Um, well, I mean, so what then did you go, did Mark, did you switch nope. back out with Mark or no Mark stayed with that that platoon, I went down to, back down to CAF because one of the JTACs down there, his wife was pregnant and was having a baby and they sent him home and I replaced him. 
And I'm just like, man, okay, I've got to balance this stuff out at some point. Yeah. Like you just, I almost miss, missed the birth of my son. As much as I hate all of the stuff that I've done to, to get me back home to my family so I can get back on track and in sync with my schedule and, and what I had planned. Um, you know, you just kind of have to, you go with what you go with, you know, it, it is yeah. what it is at the end of the day, yeah. you know, um, you may not and like you, it. And you were able to help a guy out that needed to get back for his pregnant wife and stuff. So I guess that kind of helps out. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, you look at, the, you try and, and look at the bright side, you know, sure. as much as you can, you be optimistic, you know, um, that's all you can do at, the, at yeah. that point in time. And, right. and so I went back down and now I'm with a second platoon Delta company and Pazder is the platoon sergeant. Um, and we have like Pazder and I just clicked on all levels, yeah. you know, and the platoon leader was amazing. Jim Marion, um, who became a company commander, um, a few years later at one seven five. But, um, you know, you just, I was like, well, you know, it sucks that I can't go home, but I can finish off this deployment with these dudes that are awesome, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that I know, and I've worked with, they're in the same company that I've been with for, you know, years. So right. I can't complain about that too much, Sure, you know? Um, and, and this guy gets to go back home and, you know, be with his pregnant wife. Right. That, that's great for him. I'm happy for him. Exactly. Um, and so the, the last mission that we did was we had some squirters that were rolling around and we ended up chasing these squirters down. But I remember running out, and I turned around, and Healy, who's a squad leader, was right behind me. So I turned around to see, make sure he was still there. And there was, you know, it was all marijuana fields and stuff like that. So tall grass all over the place. And I take a step back, <clears throat> and there was nothing there. There was no ground. And oh, I just, no. I, I just fall, you know, <laughs> flat on my back down this hole that was about eight feet deep. And I was like, thank God it was big enough for me to actually fall in. You know, it didn't get narrower as it went down. And yeah, I, I no broke doubt. Broke my neck, but I remember hitting, you know, and I'm like, oh my god, because it happened pretty fast. And my yeah, MVGs yeah. came down and hit my nose, and you know, I was starting to bleed from my nose. And like Healy runs up, and you know, he's like, "Dude, are you okay?" And I'm like, "I'm, I'm good, I'm good." And so he gets <laughs> on his belly along with um a couple other guys, and they're reaching down, and I'm like reaching up, grabbing their hands, and they all just you know pull me up. And then we just keep moving, you know, but <laughs> I've got, there's a, I, somewhere, I think Randy has it, but somewhere out there, there's a picture of after we got in the squirters and came back to the the main compound, there's a picture of me and Randy, you know, standing there and I've got, you know, blood coming down my nose and Randy's there as the platoon sergeant. And I'm like, man, I, I would give anything to get my hands on that picture. if I could, Yeah, I know. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but, but yeah, so came back from that deployment and, you know, PCS, you know, got there to, to Benning, super excited, you know, extremely ready to, to get settled in. Benson essentially asked me if I wanted to go to Pathfinder. And then I told him like, Hey, you know, I just got here, just PCS. It's right before Christmas. Cause it was November of 11 when I got there. Uh, it was right before Christmas. Like I, I kind of like to settle in with my house and yeah, help, sure. help get unpacked and everything. And he was like, okay, yeah, I understand. And then he came back and he was like, man, we don't want to lose this slot. So you're going to Pathfinder. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so, so, you know, went through that. Healy actually was in Pathfinder with me. So that was great. You know, oh, that's was good. There. So we studied together, but, uh, you know, having Gav, because Gav was the flight command or flight chief at the time. Mm -hmm. um, so that was great. You know, um, one thing I didn't mention was right before I went to Ranger School, Gav was like maybe a few weeks or so ahead of me. Mm -hmm. going to ranger school and so when i went through pre-ranger the cadre there they were like you're you're never going to be as good as gav you know and i'm yeah. like what the heck like i've i've seen this guy once in my life i'm like who is gav <laughs> yeah. you know like i know he's in the 17th he I know. crushed that school he was a rock star i mean yeah. just amazing it's yeah. like next it, level you know like just a yeah yeah so i was just like man like I don't know that, like, who is this guy? Like, I need to meet him, you know? <laughs> and right. so, you know, obviously, um, I think in one of my cycle breaks, I came back and Gav had just gotten to a flight and he was getting ready to either go on a jump trip or do some training. And I was standing there talking to, I think Kevin was there and Maddie was there and I was talking with them and Gav comes in cause his desk was like the first one on the left when you walked into the office <clears throat> and Gav comes in, you know, and he's like, Hey, what's up? You know? And I'm like, you know, 
doing this and um it's like that's when i was like that's gaff Mm -hmm. it's like oh you know but he was in a hurry and he's like basically came in grabbed some stuff and then and then walked out and left but uh you know it was uh it was interesting getting there finally talking to gav who was just you know and i could talk about gav for hours but Uh um just one of those personalities sure you know one of those personalities that you're like man i would i would bring you to a gunfight i would bring you to any fight yeah you know anytime yeah, he's one of the anywhere. best yeah one of the so, best for sure so that was pretty awesome but uh um you know getting to binning and then you know gav was like all right this is this is what we're doing you know we're gonna knock out ncoa first he's like because i do not want you to get onto a team and then all of a sudden you have ncoa ncoa that gets in the way um Smart. i i had to extend one deployment because uh, I think it was that 2010 deployment. I extended one month because Richie Douglas had gone to NCOA. Oh, okay. And and he couldn't come out there um, until, you know, so I basically extended and then he came out and replaced me. And I think that's essentially where Gav got it from. And I, Gav probably had some experience with that as well, along with some yeah. other guys. But yeah, <clears throat> um, Gav was like, you're going to NCOA first. And then when you get back, we're going to put you in RTC. Like as it works right now, we have coverage throughout the rest of the year. So you can go through RTC. Nice. And I'm like, okay. I was like, you know, that, that sounds great. You know? So did NCOA came back, you know, started uh, doing RTC. Um, I think I missed some of the first parts of RTC, but, you know, was able to kind of just uh, latch in with those guys at at pretty much the very beginning. Um, Sean Deegan was one of the instructors along with uh, um, Casey um yeah uh and then obviously rob as well but um you know doing that whole thing and not having to worry about deploying or anything like all of 2012 it was just pme and train yeah. i'm like this this is the life i was <laughs> right. i was gone a lot yeah. you know but the training was so unique it was yeah. different i'm like this is this is awesome you know yeah <clears throat> a lot of lessons learned, you know, a lot of maturity uh, for me because I'm like, you know, previously, you know, previous 12 years had been JTAC, 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 mm-hmm. JTAC, tactical, 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 you know, everything. Right. Now it's just a little different, you know. Yep. So it was it was great getting through that and, um, you know, deploying with those guys, doing the things that we did uh, throughout the next, you know, five years, you know, being with, with – uh, with RRC, um, you know, very, very unique stuff, you know, um, being in a position to actually, you know, cause all of the other times I'd been mentored by Ranger, you know, and now mm-hmm. I'm in a position where I'm mentoring Ranger, you know, when yeah. we have guys that are augmenting us, you know, when you're on a team and, you know, you're, you're not just the JTAC that's on the team or the JTAC that's with the platoon, you know, you're on the team. You're doing right. everything that they're doing, going through all the mission planning stuff, the MLATs, you know, I can't express the excitement, you know, and the nervousness, you know, that I know that, you know, um, about doing a, you know, a high show, you know, in the middle of the night or morning, you know, right. it's just like, it's just five miles up in the air, you know, it's yeah. just like one of those things that is just, I'm like, man, this is awesome. Yeah. There's you know, nothing so, like it. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, as you progress through the years of being on a team, you mature more and more and you have new guys that show up and they look up to you, you know, and these guys are, you know, silver star winners, mm-hmm. you know, coming from the Ranger battalions, you know, and they're showing up to RRC and they're like, Hey, um, can you help me out with this? And you're like, All right. yes, absolutely. <laughs> happy, happy to, yeah. I am more than exactly. happy. Like, what do you, I'll stay up till three o'clock in the morning and we can go over whatever you want to go over. You know, it's just one of those things, you know, um, being in with those small knit teams, um, you know, but the, uh, the one thing that I kind of want to touch on, because I didn't want to hit all the deployments with RRC. There's really no point. Um, There was, you know, just unique stuff that happened, you know, throughout it. Um, Experiences. A lot of us kind of sensitive too. So we don't need to. Yeah, exactly. So, but it was just, it's, it's, it's really cool, you know, and you try and express that to other people and like, Hey man, won't you guys come on over, you know, like, and, and it was, you know, within the 17th, you know, as it kind of progressed, it moved, it was still doing platoon stuff, you know, and then it kind of progressed into some other, you know, assault force type stuff, 
you know, and you're like, you know, it's just, it's so interesting to see the progression of where the 17th started to even where it's at today. For sure. um, last uh, Friday morning, I had about a one hour conversation with the current op soup at the 17th, you know, and we're just talking about things, you know, yeah. and, you know, it's just, it makes, it makes me proud and extremely humbled to be this one piece of sand, you know, or even smaller than that amongst all of this other stuff that, that the 17th has been a part of, you know, yeah. but um, you just feel lucky that you got to be a part of it. Right. You're not, you don't absolutely. feel like you're like, they, they talk about, you know, uh, oh, he was, he was there back in the old days or he was a plank holder or whatever, but it's like, you just, I, I, you just feel grateful for having been exposed to something like that, being a part of it, you know, it's just, yeah. Yeah. It's cool. And, and I kind of wanted to segue like towards the end of, of all of this um, into saying that about the 17th and the men and, you know, th that have gone through it and um, into when, like when Gav passed away, like I will never forget the day that I was told that Gav passed away. Cause it was right before a deployment. I think I was maybe a month, three weeks out or so from yeah. deploying again uh, in 14. I had just come back from Eloy because we had two canopy control courses set up out there mm -hmm. at the beginning of February and, and the end of February. And yeah. so I was there for two weeks at the beginning of February. Gav came out for a few days and then he was like, all right, Justin, dude, you got it from here. You know, you're going to be one of the more experienced free fall jumpers. I'm like, dude, I've got like 200 jumps. Like, <laughs> right. that's nothing, you know? Yeah, but yeah. then you tell a guy that's got 50 jumps, he's like, bro, you got 200 jumps? Yeah. But that's coming it's from like, perspective, for sure. But it's, it's coming from the RRC perspective. 200 mm -hmm. jumps is, is really nothing. Like, okay, now you can, you know, do all this other stuff. Right. You know, now you've hit that, that, that mark of you can do some other experienced, you know, more mature free fall stuff. Yeah. <clears throat> so that's my mindset. But um, so we did, you know, did that whole thing. And then um, obviously February 21st of 2014 is, you know, that Friday, like I will never forget it. You know, I was, I was in team one's team room. We were um, we had some, some guys from the battalion reconnaissance platoon that were there. And we were essentially just doing like some LPD type stuff. Like, Hey, you know, this is how you, you handle your interpreters. This is, you know, how you handle this mission set, you know, type thing. Here's some things to think about, you know, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, Garino came over and he kind of stood in the doorway and he's like, hey, man, um, you got a second? I was like, yeah. And so I, I stepped out um, uh, outside because he, he, he took me outside, which I was like, what what is going on? Yeah, what's you going know? on? Yeah. And he was like, he just kind of looked at me. He was like, Gav died. I was just like, what? I was like, what, what do you mean? Yeah. He was like, he, there was an incident out of Eloy and Gav passed away. I was like, and I just, my brain was like, okay, what? like, let me grasp this. Like, I'm just kind of yeah. reaching for air, trying to find something to, to, you know, grab onto. And I was like, all right. Um, okay. I was like, thanks. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know what to say. Oh, of course. Like, yeah. I mean, it, you, it's, it's a shock. So, I mean, it, not full blown shock, but I mean, it's your brain kind of shuts down a little bit because you're trying to you're trying to process that information. So, yeah. Yeah. And and so I walked back in and um, they were in a break. And so the I kind of looked in the team room and uh, Joe Defer was in there. Uh, Sean was in there. Um you know, two, two of the other guys, I don't think you would know them, but uh, Josh and Jason, Al Jason Halverson, and Josh Browning, they were in there. And um you know, I was like, it was like, Hey, uh, you, you guys, you guys got a second. And I just, I don't know why it was. I knew that Sean knew Gav. I knew that Joe knew Gav. Uh, I think Josh may have heard of Gav. Jason may have heard of Gav, but they were also fairly new. They had gotten there just before I had gotten onto the team. Um, and so I just kind of shut the door and I was like, I just told him, I was like, Hey, um, Gav passed away today. And they were just like, what? No, it was it wasn't Sean uh, Nate Legnetto. That's who it was. But um, either way, um, I I was like I um, I was like, are you guys good for the rest? Of, do you guys need me? <laughs> it's like right. um, because I I think I'm gonna go over to the to the squadron. They were like, dude, do it do whatever you have to do. And then Nate was a team sergeant, and Joe was the the ATL, and they were like, just text us, like, just let us know what's going on. You know, if if yeah. you need 
whatever. He was like, don't even worry about like next week is our last week. Don't like, we don't really, we can take care of it from here. I'm like, are you sure? They're like, yeah, man, we, we got it. Like you go do your stuff. I was like, all right. So I left and went over, I left and went over to the squadron, you know, and you know, obviously it was just kind of quiet. Um, I, I think, uh, Lunk had already done the notification, I believe, mm-hmm. and they were trying to figure out. I think Vansley was the original person uh, that they asked for the to be the the flow. I don't know if they call it the flow now, but the family liaison officer, mm-hmm. um, which I didn't know what that was. And so yeah. they came to me. Lunk Lunk was Chief Lunk was came to me, and he was like, "Hey, uh, you know, Vansley's got this stuff going on and he just can't do it. I think it was an MLAT or something and he just couldn't break away because he was the, the, the chief for uh, the guys in B flight. <clears throat> and um, he was like, you know, can you take this? I was like, I'd be honored to take it, you yeah. know? And he was like, I was like, but what do I do? He was like, yeah. you're going to just, we're going to get you all the training that you need. Um, they had some guys come from Maxwell. They, you know, to, to give some training to us or to me. Um, and I just, this was two hours after, uh, Alyssa got notified, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I'm like, okay. I was like, I am going to drive to the house. And so I drove to the house. Um, and I ended up living five minutes down the road from Gav and we had just spent new years together. Like one of the best new years ever. (laughs) Like we're on his deck, you know, shooting, um, uh, nine mil tracer rounds, you know, at the moon, you know, it was me, right, right. Gav, Mike Macias and Matt Davis, you know, just doing what we do, you know? Sure. Sure. And, and, uh, it was a lot of fun, but I remember driving up there, you know, and I just, I didn't know what to expect, what to do, but the next, you know, all of the moving pieces and the learning that I had to, you know, figure out at that time, going back to what we were saying about being a part of the 17th and how humble it is and how awesome it is when, when these types of events happen, which thankfully they don't happen as, as, um, as often. Um, but yeah, thank God we're not used to it. You know, thank God it it is, it's a not, it's a unique situation for sure. Yeah. It's, but it's a no fail mission. Like Mm -hmm. you've got all of these, you've heard this is a no fail mission that right there, no matter what unit, no matter what service branch you're a part of, that right there is a no-fill mission, mm-hmm. period. Um, making sure everything is ran as smoothly as possible. You know, So I didn't know the role that I was accepting when I accepted it. I just knew that, hey, someone has to do it. You're asking me to do it. I will do it. I have no sure. problem doing it. You know? Yeah, of course. But I, you know, it was yeah. after all of the missions – after, you know, the things that I had done up to that point, I had never experienced anything more difficult than that. That's a, that was yeah, probably the hardest thing. My okay. my wife at the time, you know, there was one night that I came home and she was like, Justin, like, your eyes have changed color. Like, they, they're gray, you know, and I usually have like a hazelish, like greenish, bluish eyes, you know, and, and yeah. she's like, your eyes are gray. I'm like... I just, I'm trying to focus on making sure everything is done right, you know, because I'm Mm -hmm. updating, I'm updating the squadron commander, Colonel uh, Traxler, John Traxler at the time. I'm updating Chief Lundquist. I'm updating Alyssa. I'm trying to figure out things on my own. I've got notes galore that I'm taking down. Um, Lila Young and Roy Young, they were over there constantly. Roy and I sat out on the front porch, you know, while Lila and Alyssa were inside, you know, because it's like, we're just going to, there's... I can be inside, but there's no real purpose. And the same, Roy right. was the same thing. You know, he's like, that's, we can be inside, but what are we doing? You know, so we yeah. just sat out on the front porch. You know, I would wake up in the morning and the first thing that I would do would be go over there. What, what do you need, Alyssa? You know, what, what do you need? And then she would tell me, you know, sometimes she would tell me, sometimes I'm just trying to figure it out myself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it's like, okay, Alyssa, today you're going to have to sign this piece of paper. You've got to make this decision. You've got to do this. You've got to do that. Yeah. And you had people that wanted to visit, you know, we're trying to set up a memorial service on Benning. You know, we've got two star generals that are visiting, you know, um, we're trying to figure out how to get Gav from Arizona and when that's going to happen back to Georgia. So he can be home, oh, yeah. you know, type thing. Like Alyssa's trying to figure out where am I going to bury my husband that died two days ago? 
right. you know, type thing. Like all of these things are happening simultaneously. And, and unfortunately, you have to think about these like basic logistics of it when it's such a pain. It's not like a regular thing. It's a painful uh, experience. And but you still have to kind of focus on this. I don't want to say mundane, but almost, you know, like transportation and locations. And it's like it feels it feels like it all should just be done. You know, it's like this sucks already. I wish it was just done, you know, but you still yeah. have to focus on doing the right thing. And and that's kind of where you come in, you know, because Alyssa, she was in no she was in no mindset to handle that stuff by herself. So she, that was, I'm glad she had you there to help out and Roy. Well, yeah. the one thing that I can say about Alyssa is that she, she was, obviously she was extremely tore up, you know, throughout all of this, but she, she basically said, okay, this is what's happening. I need to make this decision. You know, what is best for my future? Like how she compartmentalized the decision making. Oh, she's strong, man. Was, she's a strong uh, woman. It was it was amazing. I I yeah. I just I I'm like I couldn't do this. I couldn't yeah. do what she did at all. You know. Yeah. And 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 I'll say this, like, you know, I was I was at this this you know pivotal point through all of this stuff, but it wouldn't have happened without that that brotherhood, you know, and and even the sisterhood because the pink team that the 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 ladies of the 17th that are literally the backbone of all the men that do the stuff right they came out they showed up like when yeah. it was like hey we need dinners oh by the way it, it, it there's these you know allergies that have to be taken care of they showed up and there's a know? whole house full of people it's not just Alyssa her you know she's got you know, yeah and, and it was like and- yeah, and it was oh, that was the other yeah. You know, she had you know her six, her her and Josh's six kids. You know, and that was just one of those things where it's like, you you showed they all of them showed up. They're like, what do what can we do? You know, yeah. like I kept getting texts like, what can we do? And so yeah. I had to basically ask one of the wives like, can you coordinate all of this for me, and just have be my touch point so I can help out with all of this stuff, and then then well, I can yeah. do this with Alyssa. You know, but it was one of those things. You know, for me, I was so nervous about it. Because I'm like, I can't fail at this. Number one, I love the dude. Number two, I love the family. You know, number three, I love all of these guys, you know, right. that are basically saying, in my mind, Justin, don't don't mess this up. Yeah. Because you, you only get one shot at this. You know, that's it. You only that's get one shot big, at it. That's a pretty big responsibility, man. Yeah. From what I remember, I think you crushed it. I mean, I don't think, I think it all went real well from what I remember, so... There were some hiccups. Yeah. <laughs> there oh, were definitely course. some hiccups, you know. Of course. But it it was it was funny because um going to the church, you know, Gav wanted the the Leonard Skinner songs played. And so I had right. to talk to the to you know to the preacher and he was like, Yeah, you know, no no problem. Because it was a big church, Cascade Hills in yep. Columbus, Georgia. And um, you know, Alyssa wanted to spend one last night with with Josh, you know, before you know he got put over at the Alabama uh, national cemetery and, and buried, you know, and all of the family dealings and trying to coordinate everything. I mean, it wasn't just a 17th thing. I have to give 100% um, honors to the 15th guys that were there at Benning too, because yeah, they, right. they, they showed up as well. You know, For they sure. help, they help drive people around, show up to airports and go to, go to hotels and make sure that the family members were loaded up. All of them were loaded up and they were there, you know, at the places that they needed to be, because there were a lot of, you know, different moving cogs in this big will, you know, to, yeah. you know, to, to coordinate, you know, and, and it was just, it's one of those things that, and I just wanted to bring this up at the end because it's one of those things that, you know, we do all of these amazing things, you know, we do, but when it comes to that, I, I mean, there's a picture when we did the memorial at the church, um, or the uh, it was the viewing at the church um, the day before the the burial, you know. And you mm-hmm. look at the picture out next to the little waterfall rocks that they have out there, and it's you know it's like man, look at look at all of these guys that are in the past, you know, the Ed Shulmans, yeah. the JDs, the Brandies, you know, all of these guys, you know, the Schleichs, yeah. like. You could go on and on and on and on and on and, and list so many names, and it's just it's amazing the um, what we have, you know. Yeah, it's just, you, you can't complain sure. about it at all. Like, it's pretty awesome, you know. I I didn't know going back to 2006 when Chris Gendron was sent, Gendron was sitting down and talking to me, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. <laughs> And I would, I would, I thought I would focused on the mission. I didn't focus on all this other stuff, the possibilities of things that could happen. 
Sure. You know, it was like, well, I want to do this mission, you know, yeah. but when it comes to like the gap situation um, and there's been other situations as well that the guys have just come together, you know, yeah. they're just like a dude needs help. You know, we're just going to do it. I've talked to Tommy case multiple times, you know, yeah. I'm like, Hey brother, can you lend me your ear? <laughs> All right. I got you. <laughs> you know, yeah. I know it's 11 o'clock at night or midnight or one o'clock in the morning. How long do you want to talk? You know, right. and that's, that's yep. the, that is, that is the essence, I think, of the 17th. I think so too. Uh, not to say that we have the, uh, the market cornered on that. Uh, I, I, I reckon that a lot of units are like that, but um, we definitely had it, man. We for sure had with that camaraderie and that, that brotherhood that it takes to get through tough times like that. You know, I mean, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah. I mean, and, you know, there's always some issues that go on or there's some like animosity or whatever, but it, it always it never rises to the level where you forget about the big picture. You know, it, it always comes back to the importance of what we're doing. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But then, uh, you know, moving on from RRC, you know, I moved into the opposite position, um, which uh, I filled in after Kevin left. Okay. You know, and and for me, it was one of those things. It was surreal again because Gav yeah. had been in that position when he had when he passed away, and I'm like, okay, yeah. like I'm here in this office, in this seat, at this desk, where Gav used to be, you know, where where Kevin was, where right. all of these guys in the past that I look up to, and I am the operations superintendent of one, in my opinion, one of the most amazing units, you know, that continues to go through all these different changes, these different struggles, you know, whatever it may be, but the, they, they keep showing up and showing out and accomplishing amazing, amazing things, you know? And not to mention the fact that being the op soup is hard because you're at any given time, a third of that squadron is deployed at all times. Right. Like, so you're, it, you never get a break. You're never no. like, okay, now I can, I can relax. And you nope. Know, it's like op soup is the focal point of all that activity. So, yeah. yeah. It was, and so, you know, at the end of my 11 years in November of 18, when I PCS'd from the 17th down to headquarters, you know, it was just like, it was really hard to leave. But at the same time, I knew that that was coming at some point. Sure. It's inevitable, you know. For sure. Yeah. Um, you know, and, but I still like in my office or in my cubicle, you know, now like I've got <laughs> my RRC patch, I've got my 17th patches up there, you know, and, and you walk around and the, the great thing about it is you walk around there and you've got, you know, the pilots, you know, and, and every, all these, you know, other uh, soft uh, aircraft platforms that are out there. And they're like, oh, I know the 17th, I know that call sign, yeah. you know, and it's like, heck yeah, you know, so <laughs> yeah. it's, that's pretty cool, you know? Yeah. Yeah, was it a tr was a weird transition to go from like uh, having a, a like a small office going to like the op soup office, and then you, then you go to AppSoc and you're like in some cubicle sharing it with some dude right next to you. It's like you're oh back in 100%. office space again. Yeah, so yeah. weird. <laughs> it's it's and you know we joke about it, you know. But the good thing is that you know like I've got it's me, a PJ, a controller, a sto, and an SR guy. Our, all five of us that sit yeah. in Stanaval, and you know there's a lot of changes that are happening within the air force special warfare community um mm -hmm. over the past probably two or three years you know been huge changes like we've got our own 3500 vol one and vol two you know nice. that's that's pulled everything together um um but the, the the transition to that for me was more of a a mental mindset an mm -hmm. operational cycle mindset like tempo wise because i'm so used to like you were saying you know, whether you're, you know, on a team or at a platoon, at, you know, at first, second, third range of battalion, like you're always in some, some cycle, you know, it's just, right. it, it just does this like a parachute. It's just always mm -hmm. like this. And so you're either coming back from deployment, gearing up for a deployment or deployed. Right. right. Those, those are the three cycles. And that's the constant, you know, sitting there at, at um, I say, one of the leadership positions, you know, is the op soup. Like you're constantly like, OK, these guys are coming back. These guys are doing MLAT. These guys are, or whatever. You know, these guys are deployed. What do they need? I can't. It's so easy to forget about these guys that are deployed. Sure. You know, it, it as, as much as I hate to say it, yeah. um, I found myself like. I can talk to these guys a lot easier than I can these guys. These guys mm -hmm. are on a completely different time schedule and, you know, halfway around the world. Right. And so I, I did my best 
to make an effort to call down, you know, and talk to those guys, you know, whether it was once a month or whatever, I just tried to get them on the phone or talk to them on messenger or whatever the case may be, sure. you know, and, and trans transitioning into that op super role from RRC, you know, you, you've got a beard, you're on relaxed grooming standards, you know, whatever you're in and out of the squadron constantly, you know, yeah. and I will, I, I will say this. I remember, um, it was early 2017 when I was getting ready to step into that role. And I came back and I had an awards presentation up in Bethesda, Maryland that I was going to. And um, I had to shave like two days before I was to leave, put on an, a, an actual uniform, like get my blues ready and stuff. But once I stepped into the, to the op soup role and the shaving part was weird, you know, filling your face again. But um, <laughs> right. once I stepped into that op soup role, I, there was one day that I was walking through the hallways at the 17th. I, I, you know, moved into the office. I was still trying to like get my feet settled. Like, okay, what, what do I need to focus on? Like, I've got to change this mindset um, from flight chief to now op suit. And <clears throat> one of the, um, one of the girls that was up front uh, in the commander support staff, you know, I came around the corner and she was like, oh, hey, good morning, Sergeant Foles. And I smiled and I was like, hey, good morning. I was like, how are you? She was like, oh, you do smile. <laughs> and I was like, huh. And I, that just stuck in the back of my head. And I went back to my office and I kind of reflected on that. And I'm like, you know, they don't really know me at all. Yeah. You know, and we're going through a big transition where the commander is getting ready to, to leave. The, you know, we're going to have a new commander. Um, the squadron superintendent, he's not here yet, um, but he's coming at some point this summer. Mm -hmm. uh, the director of operations, he he is he's here, um, but he was going through some personal stuff at the time. Um, I was like, that I think that's what this squadron needs. It's it, they need to know that everything is going to be okay, and and yeah. I'm like they see these changes because I know that everyone saw these changes coming. Like I've been a staff sergeant before, you know, right. I've been, I've been a flight chief before talking to other, you know, flight chiefs and like, man, what, what do we do? How does Manning look, you know, type stuff. Yeah. And um, so I made it a point after that. I said, every single day I'm going to go around and I'm going to talk to everyone. I've just, so I would go up to the commander support staff and I would just sit up there and I would talk to, to, I think there were, three at the time we had up there yeah. and I'll just sit there and be like, Hey, what are you guys doing this weekend? You know? And I learned about their family, their kids, things that were going on. I would go down to supply. I'd go to the radio guys. I would go to AFE. I talked to, you know, these people and try and figure things out. <clears throat> and slowly um, people started to come by my office, you know, and knock on my door. Like, Hey, certain folks, you got a minute? Yep. Got a minute. You know, what do you need? Sometimes it was easy. Sometimes they would shut the door and sit down and talk to me about personal stuff. You know, yeah. sometimes they just needed a space to cry and talk to talk to someone, you know. Yep. And I I felt extremely honored, you know, when those things happened. It was it was amazing. I was like, okay, you know, not only am I the operator because I was like, yeah, I'm the operations superintendent. Let me focus on the dudes, you know, but that's not what it's all about. It's about yeah. bringing everything together, training, you know, equipment, all of this stuff together. And at the same time, I was like, I'm also a senior NCO. Right. So what I, as a senior NCO, I need to be approachable, especially in this seat. You know, I can't, sure. I can't just, you know, oh, this is my flight over here. I'm going to worry about my guys. Sure. There's nothing wrong with that. But when you step out of that, you know, I think it's really important to open yourself up to all the other people that are, that are sure. within the unit. You know, so yeah, it, it, it that was another humbling experience for me as well. Yeah, that job keeps you busy for sure. Yeah, and I like I like that, man. I'm glad you did that. I mean, it, there's a lot, a lot of people will, you know, maybe look down on support or look down on, you know, the front office guys or whatever. But they're they're the backbone of that squadron, and they are that we we wouldn't have been able to do anything without those guys. You know what no. I mean? It would have been, it would just come to a screeching halt. And uh, yeah. Some people for, forget about that. They they forget how important those guys are. To well, especially especially what we need to do. Yeah, and especially at the seventeenth, because you know a lot of people, especially on the AFSOC side of the house, with all these other STSs that are out there, they are all located in one spot. You know, right. and the the seventeenth has three different locations. Yep. Again, on this constant cycle of coming and going and in the middle of stuff. You yeah. know, which requires attention and the same amount of attention 
you know, at all levels. And right. so, you know, when when guys and were, one of those units are way, is way out in Washington, it's they and, you know, at least Savannah, they you may see those guys once in a while for jump trips or whatever. Yep. But yeah, the guys in Washington, you hardly ever see those guys. Exactly. And yeah. so but our support people a lot of times are one deep people, maybe two deep. You you have these people along with um, the POTIF functions, you know, the, the psychologists, the strength and conditioning coaches, the athletic trainers. But these people, whenever guys return from deployment or whenever they're getting ready to go on to a deployment, we have a package that's going out to these units and physically sitting there for a week. You know, nice. and and helping them out. Like, what what do you need from supply? What do you need from um, strength and conditioning? Athletic trainers on the podium side of the house. You need to talk to you know the um, the, the psych doc. You know, what do you need? You know, yeah, so yeah. that's the other on the flip side. Like, even though our guys, you know, at at the um, at the line units, if you will, even though they're deploying, you know, and and going through stuff, like our supply is always moving. You know, the physical therapist is always going out and. And even the guys that are downrange, hey, you know, hey, Doc, uh, uh, Jonathan McQuaig was our uh, physical therapist while I was there. But, you know, hey, uh, Captain McQuaig, like, I've got this that's going on. What can you, what can I do while I'm deployed? How do I maintain this so it doesn't get worse? Because I'm still going to yeah. do what I'm going to do. And you know, that yeah, I'm, I'm gonna still going to go out. Yeah. So, but I'm at least I'm reaching out and saying, what can I do to not, not make this worse? So when I get back, I can make it better, you know, and not just completely break it. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, you know, that, that was also another kind of phased thing. And the, the changes that you had seen, you know, from like when I first got to the 17th, being under ACC, transitioning over into AFSOC, you know, and it was, very, what I didn't realize is that AFSOC didn't palm money from us, you know, so that was right. That was that was uh, actually worse at the beginning. It was actually worse when you when we transitioned to AFSOC. Yeah, because nobody had nobody had prepared for it at all. Yeah. <laughs> right. So when I think I think Schleich was the one that said that, you know, and I was like, oh, oh yeah. my god, I didn't know that, you know. Yeah. But um, but, but, but that's also good because that's what leaders do. You don't like don't yep. worry about this, man. Like we're gonna take care of you. You go out and do right. the mission. You know, we'll worry about all of this other stuff that yep. needs to be worried about. You know, and talking with Kevin, you know, when I think it was you and Brandy that Kevin's like, Oh, I really need to do this and go out and train on the machine gun range with, with this. And you and Brandy are literally sitting back with all of this. And I think the way that he words it is you've got all of this experience, thousands and thousands of hours of experience and you're coming together and you're talking with, I think it was Chella about like, Hey, I, th I think Kevin really needs to focus on this. Yeah. And that yeah. like Kevin and I, we, ch we chat pretty, pretty often, you know, and have coffee and stuff. And, you know, it's that whole iron sharpens iron, you know, type thing. It's where you get around these guys, and at the time, I think Kevin may have been a staff sergeant, but you guys are sitting there, and, and you're not questioning his decision. It's like, well, what's what's going to make Kevin sharper, you know? Yeah, it's what's like a discussion make... on how to get him, how to go to the next level or, you know, to, to determine what's best for him. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and that's, that's the one thing that I love about, you know, the, the people at the 17th as well is that, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of thrust. You know, but then the leadership comes in and it just provides a little bit of vector. You know, we're not That's trying true, to yeah. we're not trying to we're not trying to get you to slow down. We just right. want to vector you in the right direction, you know, yep. so you don't just go haywire and you know crash and burn. Um That's right. and, and I will say this, that's one thing that if if I could go back, you know, and redo things, you know, I would probably sit there at some point and tell my old Justin self, Hey dude, take a break. Like, take a break. And I think Brandy or someone in a previous podcast mentioned it because they were, you know, the commander was just like, or maybe it was Tommy, but it was like, hey, we just need one more, just one more. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. Well, that's one thing that, you know, for me, I always had in the back of my mind, just, I, I, just one more, you know, one, one more jump. You know, we can do one more jump today. You know, yeah. all of a sudden now you're up at 11 jumps, you know, for the whole day and you're freaking right. exhausted. Like you're spent, you know, yeah. and, when you put that onto deployments after deployments after deployments and training after training after training, you know, and this this whole thing, like the question that you asked me before, transitioning from the 17th down to AFSOC headquarters, that ops tempo and that cycle, that's what got oh, to me the most. Yeah. Right there, you know, because I was, was so like used a vacation to go to AFSOC. <laughs> I would well, I was so used to a decade of just go, 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 go one more PCS yep. train PCS, do this like all the time. And then I get down here and it was like, 
you just kind of slow down and then all this stuff still had the momentum, you know, and it just, it's like, boom, now it catches up. Yeah. So that was a very interesting thing for me, you know, transitioning as well. It took me about two years to actually transition into headquarters. I bet. <laughs> so <laughs> now you can relax and you can settle in and, yeah. you know, focus on the, the creepy, uh, strategic level stuff that you need right. to. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Well, man, this has been great. I don't want to take much more of your time, but I, I, I'm, I could talk to you for the rest of the day if you wanted to. Um, this is, thanks a lot for doing this, man. I can't thank you enough. This is, I, I knew when, when we had that discussion before about what we we're going to talk about, I knew it was going to be interesting, but I had no idea it was going to be like this. So I just want to, I want to thank you. And, um, I also want to wish you good luck because you're not, you're still in. So, I, you know, what's, uh, what's next for you? Do you have any idea of what you want to do next? Retire. <laughs> oh yeah. Are you coming up for retirement? Yeah. May of 2024 will be my, my retirement. So this okay. time next year, a little bit less than that, I'll be pretty much, you know, internship, um, and basically done with the, with the air force until my final out. Nice. So you doing yeah. that skill bridge thing? Um, yeah, so the Air Force has a skill bridge, and then SOCOM has a, another internship program as well. Oh, it's, okay. a, it's a little bit easier path um, than having to go through the Air Force skill bridge. Um, yeah, so there's less mission. there's less yeah. uh, hurdles that you have to jump through, and um, okay. it's pretty easy uh, for the approval process. So. Oh, good, good deal. Yeah. But JD, man, I want I want to say that again. I thank you for doing this. Um, the only reason why I took close to three hours is to take longer than Kevin. I had to beat him. <laughs> Just joking. But uh, I didn't intend for it to go this long. But not a, know, no. I mean, I, I had to look. I looked at the clock. I'm like, I wonder where we are. And it was. I had no idea it was that long. I mean, it was just. Uh, you, you, no, I appreciate it. Don't worry about the time. It was, it was, it was not wasted by any means. So good. Yeah, yeah. it was good. Awesome. All right, well, brother. You, uh, yeah, man, I hope you take care. And I, I look forward to listening to all the other podcasts, whether it's, you know, what, whatever, what you've got going on is, is, um, is really good. And I enjoy, I listen to everything. So I appreciate well, it. I appreciate it. Yeah. I'm just, uh, I, it's really, it's really fun for me to hear everybody, you know, catch up and, you know, I haven't seen you guys in so long and then hear your stories from that I may have heard, but in the past or may have missed. And it's just nice to hear all that stuff. So I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. All right, man. All right, brother. All right. Talk to you later. See ya.